Welcome to the Town of Situates Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday, August 21st, 2018. And at this time, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, on the first uh, uh, item that we have is an acceptance of our agenda, and I would accept a motion to accept it. Motion to move the agenda. Motion by Ms. Uh, Canfield, seconded by Ms. Curran. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, good evening. Um, Let's move right along. We'll go to um, walk-ins. Are there any walk-ins this evening? Saying none, that's fine. Um, I just want to at least let everybody understand we're having a meeting here at the library, town library tonight, because um, one was there was it's a meeting room. It's here for the public uh, to be able to use for public meetings. Second, uh, there were some issues at one point during the. Uh, I should say, not so much the construction, but afterwards, there was a noise issue. And so the board decided to have a meeting here to test the room and the, the noise level to see if, if there's any of the noise coming from one of the condensers. Um, at this point, I don't hear it. So um, I think that's successful. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, so that's the reason why we're having the meeting here tonight. Uh, second thing is, I just want to at least let people know, this is live through the SCTV Facebook page. That sits with community television. That's SCTV. Not the has to be uh, misconstrued with the '70s uh, comedy show or comedy uh, out of Chicago. Um, so I just want to make sure that people understand that it is not live by our cable, but it will be put up on cable afterwards. But it is live. So all our um, I think it's fair, Seth. All our um, meetings at the town hall are live, both cable and uh, live uh, by uh, SCTV. The it is live on paper. Yeah. So we get a vote. So anyway. All right. That being said, I'm going to turn over now to our town administrator, Jim Udo, uh, to uh, tell us what's... Oh, thanks to the board real quick. Um, just, we had a meeting last week on water, just to let you know where we are. We've got several meetings with Ty and Bond since last week's meeting to kind of map out where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, right now, we're waiting for a document for them to prepare bid documents for the ice picking. We have $80,000 for Ty and Bond ice picking right now in our budgets for started on that. Uh, we will be looking to appropriate additional money at the fall town meeting to continue that. So we're going to get started with what we have coming up today. Uh, we got to crawl the back and make a couple of tweaks to it, but we should have that out and ready to go, get that bid, and uh, have some ice picking and some pipe cleaning done early in the fall. Probably October, I think we talked about right, Kevin. Uh, we're going to look at some of the places that we think we make the most bang for the buck. Uh, followed by that, we'll be looking for some money to do a hydraulic analysis of the system. That will let us map out where to go next for ice paving. Also, let us plan on our flushing program because we're looking for money for flushing to do a town-wide flushing in the spring. So just on the groundwater issues and the water issues, right now at the town meeting, um, and this is preliminary, $200,000 for ice paving and pipe maintenance, $100,000 for the flushing program, 150,000 for the replacement of the sand filter at the treatment plant. So the water goes through a sand filter and a carbon filter. We replaced the carbon filter last year. We need to replace the sand filter. That would take place over the winter time because we can't do it when the plant's operating. Uh, $75,000 for the hydraulic analysis. And then we were in discussion about uh, what was discussed in the meeting last night. Some sort of point person, uh, brown water person, we are looking at that maybe as almost an assistant water superintendent, and that person will, for lack of a better way of putting it, be responsible for the distribution system, the pipes, the pipe, and the ground water. Uh, we're still talking about that, but that's kind of where we're in the ballpark uh, on that. So that's just in the one week with the water. Um, and then again in the spring, we'll come back. We'll do the pipe replacement over the summertime. We'll be back with additional articles for more larger capital uh, in the spring after we do the hydraulic analysis and we'll also be doing a water study, a full complete water study, and that'll be paid for all in our pot with the two hundred thousand uh, dollars that we got from the toll brothers project. So uh, we'll get going on that. <coughs> at the town meeting, uh, we don't want to open the water tonight. Right now we're looking at about twenty articles give or take, depending on what we have. Um, and uh, I have a list that I can give to the board when we firm it up and we'll wait to see what happens tonight. Next thing is we continue to work with the school department, Mass DOT, on the crossing lights for Group 3A at the town hall. Uh, it's been tied up with Mass DOT for a while in design. I signed a contract of the agreement this week for Mass DOT for the maintenance of the lights. So I'm hoping that's a sign that Mass DOT is going to pop that out quickly. 
Uh, once it gets out, we have to bid it out to install it. We'll also include a sidewalk from where it crosses to the town hall to connect it to the middle school uh, sidewalk. So the whole thing will be handicap accessible when you cross the street. Because right now, you'll be crossing to that grass area in front of the town hall. Uh, last thing, because now we have a big agenda just for the board, uh, for the record. Uh, I did pass my FAA test, so now I am a licensed pilot, drone pilot. Uh, but uh, I did pass that, so uh, if you see me flying a drone, I'm, I'm fully licensed tomorrow. So I'm covered by the insurance. Thank you. That's all you have for tonight. Um, just a person. Seth, can, uh, can you hear me? <coughs> the mic has is okay. So we only have two mics, so I just want to make sure you, you make sure that we can get uh, the voices. Um, questions? I just want, uh, um, just Jim wanted to make sure I know after the meeting all of us sent you our feedback yep. in terms of action items and just comment and stuff. What's the status of that? Uh, I got the last of those, I think Monday. Uh, I sent them over to the chair, so I just have to sit down with John at some point and try to go through them and prioritize and give the board a prioritize list which then you can discuss. Okay. But I got the last of them yesterday. Great. My intent was to have our next meeting on September 4th, go over those items, and then have a discussion um, follow up with, uh, as a result of our meeting last week with the board. Great. I just want to say thank you to the, um, some of the, the water department was out the next day to some of those key residents. Um, I drove by and saw them there to the work um, over at Curtis Street. So I just want to thank them for acting immediately on the concerns that came forward that time. Yeah, actually, uh, We've had uh, over 150 reports to the brown water. 58. 158. 33% of them were for clean water. Uh, anyone who left a message and asked for a call back has been called back within 24 hours. Great. Uh, there were 91 uh, individual responses with brown water iterations. Yeah, I apologize. It's probably like that. The main town hall, so I went back across and didn't have to uh, But they've been able to track those. And anybody with a Please call me back within 24 hours and call back to the water department. So uh, they've been hunting those down and, and it was a real bad problem. They call them back and if they get out there right away, they got them out and check it out. So they're, they're really working on it. Are, are most of those reports um, within service of the or is That's it? through the search. Okay. Very few through the uh, new automated line, most of the computer. Okay. Good. Anyone else? Well, let's see. Let's move on. We're going to move on to our 715 discussion vote of outdoor entertainment permits. And the first one is 60 Old Oak and Bucket Road. Could you come on up, please? Thank you. Here. Yep, right there. Okay. Um, so if you could just uh, tell us your name. Hi, my name is Karen Alstad. And you're at... 60. 60 Old Oak and Bucket. Okay, and you're looking to have an outdoor entertainment license for September 2nd yes. to Sunday yes. uh, from 6.30 uh, p.m. until 10.30 p.m. Yes. Like. Um, you got a live band, and um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you've sent out uh, notice to your neighbors. I invited everyone who's in the <laughs> Here's your property. And most of them are coming. Gotcha. Are there any questions from the board? No. no. Sure. Entertain a motion then. Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Karen Alstad of 60 Old Oak and Bucket Road for a private party on 9-2-2018 with live music by the Doc Ellis Band from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. It's a motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Harris. All those, signify, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Congratulations and enjoy <laughs> Labor Day. Doc Ellis thanks you too. <laughs> we'll um, moving on to 114 Man Hill Road. Good. And you're looking for an outdoor entertainment license for August 25th from 3 p.m. until 9 p.m. Correct. I'm Rich Westelman. I'm the owner of 114 Hill Road. It's going to be a party with our next door neighbors, the Lagrantarians, at 106. Good. And the same question, are you, have you given notice to your neighbors? We have. We got the list of the butters and handed out our invitations, and most of them are coming as well. Good. <coughs> um, any questions from the board? Seeing none, I take a motion. Move to grant an outdoor entertainment permit to Sherry and Richard Wesselman on 114 Ben Hill Road for music gathering on August 25th, 19, uh, 2018, with live music from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. Motion. motion by Ms. Canfield, seconded by Mr. Harris. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much. All the best. Enjoy. 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 All right, now we're going to move on to um, 720 and 715. Um, it's a public hearing, so we're going to hold off on the 720 because we still have about seven minutes to go. Um, so is Karen, Joseph, or Brad? Can we move on to that item? Or so you handle that? Yes, yeah, he right said it's Situate uh, Construction. Moving to a discussion vote. C side at Situate Construction Inspection Phase 1 contract for $95,000. So this is the, uh, the town's engineer that will oversee the Toll Brothers project. This money is from Toll Brothers. With the estimate from the engineer was about $88,000. My recommendation to Karen was to make sure you put a little bit extra in there uh, in case they dig a hole and find something nobody expected. We didn't want to have to back money back and ask for extra money. So uh, the 95000 is for phase one. Uh, they went out with three bids. Um, I think this is our only, I'm just trying to bring it up right now. Most of the was our respondent, and they would be the town's engineer for the Toll Brothers project. And I forgot who it was, but. Somebody else did not respond. So Less than Samson. Questions from the board? When will they start, Jim? Uh, well, they won't start until all the prerequisites are met. So right now, there is a pre-construction meeting scheduled for next week. Construction cannot start until at least three weeks after the pre-construction meeting. And they are waiting on the bond at this point. So. Until all the prerequisites are met, they can't stop. A pre construction meeting next week is the big that starts the clock ticking to when they can stop. Okay. Thank you. you know, Have we worked with this firm before? Yes. And um, good results with them? Yeah, they did all the preliminary work and we've been doing the plans and stuff for the planning wood, so they're familiar with the project. Uh, mostly wood is a good group to have been around long. Oh. Wait on. When do they stop? When does their project? When does their contract end? And again, can you? You have to put the scope of services, Sean. I wasn't. I just yeah. All right. Okay. It's it's phase months. one of the. Yeah. But it's so phase I, one of the I'm project. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think it said thirty months. Yeah, that's what I had a question. No, that's good. Uh, Karen, go ahead. When it says phase one, that it's talking about a thirty-month construction, I could. I just didn't understand what phase. Two would be is it the houses or we're not no it's it, the project is in two phases kind of a front phase and a back okay. phase okay so that's yeah. um, and i just have a couple of questions which we, you know uh, might, these might be for karen so if you don't know we can um you make it up you, can make, you, know, you will give us some points. um in their oversight there was no provision there you said there's no gas lines going into the project and i just was wondering about uh you know these people might figure out that we might need generators down the road. So, I don't know, that's a follow-up question for Karen, just to see Yeah, I mean, that would be the design of the project as opposed to the engineer. Okay. Um, and there was also no, in this contract, there's no um, uh, environmental remediation oversight. Contract. That's a separate contract? Separate contract. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right, in that case, then, uh, Entertain a motion if somebody wants to make one. Did you motion? Yeah. Okay. Move to award and sign a contract for construction inspection phase one, planning board special permit, stormwater permit, and conservation commission order of conditions um, for the seaside is situate to Horsley Witten Group Incorporated for the amount not to exceed ninety-five thousand dollars. Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded right. by Mr. Vignani. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, unanimous. So let's see if we can get something else out. How about um, is uh, Sam's? Sam's on the harbor? Come on up. Be good. Have a seat. This is a 740 discussion vote, common vicular for transfer of business. Sam's on the harbor. Are you Michael? I am. I'm Mike Thibodeau. I live at 40 Brook Street. And the restaurant's at 146 Front Street. <laughs> yeah, it's a dream commute, something I've dreamed about for a long time. So you're taking, I, I assume then you're, you're purchasing the, the company? That's or? correct. Yeah, for you. Buying a restaurant from Sam and uh, really looking forward to taking the wheels. 
you got a great, a great uh, restaurant there. You know, looking forward to it. Um, questions from the board? Any changes to the menu or? Other than tightening it up, for the next six months, it's pretty much going to stay business as usual as I get a hold of the whole thing. And then we'll see what we can do to grow it. Make sure it's add, add what people want, remove what people don't, yeah. and you know, keep it as, as the working man's food, working woman's food. Yeah. You know. Working Yes. <laughs> it's a great spot, so congratulations. Thank you. What's your experience? I work here in Situate doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, at, well, scrubbing dishes at the Mill Wharf is where I started. Uh, learning under Bill at the dockside. I worked there for like three years, four years maybe. I worked over at uh, what's now, well, the dockside is now uh, Reba. Um, I worked at uh, the Harbor View for maybe five or so or more years uh, doing steaks and lobsters and casseroles. Uh, before that turned into tea cakes. Um, worked up in on 3A at Bergson's for Marco. Uh, so that's your corporate food. And worked at uh, Camp Swanto for the Boy Scouts serving the seating of 300 family style three times a day for eight weeks, and that was some pretty neat high volume stuff. Um, for a while I've been doing technology, and I'm just done with the computers and go back to the culinary arts. Good for you, right? John Cameron? Yeah. I mean, they, they asked the questions I thought to ask, and menu and gallons and cents, and it's an asset to the community, and I hope well, it continues. Yeah. Cool. I have to ask you to change the name. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, motion then? No, Approve a common ridiculous license for the new old Michael J. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. Of Mike Citroen Harbor Inc. doing business at Sam's on the Harbor located at 146 Front Street, Citroen Bass on 266. Candidate for the health approval. Motion by Mr. Harris. Seconded Second. by Ms. Kerman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mike, congratulations. Thank you for your success and continue. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to go back to the 720 public uh, hearing and discussion vote. Transfer of license for a package store, wine and malt beverage, off-premises annual license um, concerning 7-Eleven. And the attorney is at Aida? Yep. John Aida. Yep. John, good to see you. And with you is? This is Mary Ellen Hayden. She's the uh, proposed manager of record. Okay. So uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this state before John Aida, the current clerk at Miller, 28 State Street, Boston. Um, this is Mary Ellen Hayden, who has uh, been involved um, at this location for the last several months, but been involved with uh, Jaskies and 7-Eleven for close to 20 years. Uh, also in attendance for, and on behalf of 7-Eleven, is the field consultant for this location is Rose Closure, as well as the director of North East Operations, Kevin Miller, there in the front row here. Welcome, folks. Um, this is a transfer. Uh, the corporate entity, 7-Eleven, is purchasing this license from the former franchisee. And this is going to be um, a store that's going to be operated by Settle of Massachusetts Inc., uh, which is their corporate entity. Uh, the franchise agreement ended a couple months ago with that franchisee, and they've taken over the operation of the store uh, since that time. There's no currently no sales of beer and wine until uh, this license has been approved by, by your uh, this board and the ABCC. Um, the former franchisee has we're familiar with, and uh, Mary Ellen's familiar with, had some issues um, and concerns with their security, whether it's the staff or the use or non use of scanners. Uh, that's why Mary Ellen was brought in, and um, also 7 Eleven uh, is taking over as well, because it's important to them that the store is operated a certain way. Uh, Mary Ellen, as I stated before, has 20 years' experience. She started at Tedeschi's. When Tedeschi's was acquired by 7 Eleven, she was folded into 7-Eleven. So she's been with 7-Eleven for about two years, three years, okay? And prior to that, um, almost 17 years with Tedeschi. So all in all, 20 years uh, with those two entities. And then prior to that, she worked at uh, Luke's Liquors in Rockland, and she, where she started and got her experience uh, specifically in the liquor industry. She is TIP certified, all the staff is or will be by the time the product is on the shelf. I think there's three or four other staff members that have that certification. Um, and the policy changes we're looking to do is that every customer is going to be asked for an ID. Um, and in addition to that, they do have a POS system that is, does have a scanner that's integrated into that. So any product 
that would be brought up. It's not just punching in the date of birth, they actually have to check the ID against what comes up in their scanner. Uh, so they feel that that's gonna be an improvement on the prior operations. Uh, again, they take it very seriously. Uh, Mary Ellen was brought in for that purpose and she's gonna run a tight ship, so. Uh, we hope that this transition is pretty seamless. You're not going to do really any changes to the hours of operation or the actual day-to-day -day operations. It's just it's new ownership, uh, but it's still set all up its score. Just a few. So, you know, um, so the, it's the corporation that's owning 7-Eleven is going to be owning the store? It's not going to be a franchise. Okay. Correct. Is there a, rec a number that they're allowed to have? There is. There's seven stores seven. within the state. Okay. And so this will be seven? This will be seven. We're making sure that once everything's approved, they're out there. Well, you know, the max, then are over. Okay. And the other question I had was, you said POS, so I'm not sure what the POS is. But so the point of sale, so of sales. anytime okay. any product is brought up to the counter, yeah. um, a lot of times they would have any stores that might have it with tobacco products, some have it with alcohol products, and before it would just be check an ID and enter a validated birth. Right. It goes a little bit further than that, it actually scans the ID. Um, so they're trying to stay on top of the technology and, and really improving on that. Okay. And the reason why I ask that is because obviously the history of this location has had some violations in the past and um, I believe, I forgot, did we, we did um, um, give them um, probation or we, did, we, we ended up taking a day or something. Um, so I guess my point is, is from your folks standpoint, you are buying a new store in my mind, but there's a history there. And obviously, and I appreciate the fact that you're going to be doing the scanner. That's one of the things that we found to be successful here in the town. Um, but to be vigilant and lose a sales worth it than losing a day's sale of business. And I say that because from my vantage point, there's a history there. We need to eradicate that going forward. And I hope that uh, you folks will do just that. Excuse me, I've already put that in through cigarettes. You have to show an ID and scan. Good. I don't care how old they are. Good. And I have all sales, but that's not my fault. I just I appreciate that. And I only ask that because I know that was the one issue that I had. Um, I'm not sure what the rest of my board has, but I just want to make sure you do uh, questions from the board. Cameron? Uh, just one question, probably for Jim. Um, the outstanding violations against the former owner, do they track? Will they transfer as well? Because we have a a rolling policy of strikes against? No. Is it the slate starts clean? No, it's not clean. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the state considers that the same way as well. It is a new operator. It's a new um, again, as the chairman stated, it's something to, you know, if they're aware of the past history here, but it doesn't necessarily carry over to punish the, the new operator. No, you would ask a question. I was curious to know how many stores that you own have like a license and I know one at the end of Grove Street. I don't think that does. So a lot yeah, a lot of the stores I obviously you can imagine that there are, you know, scores and scores of seven elevens, but um, those that would hold the license would most likely be a franchisee. Uh, there's no others in town that are owned by this entity, seven yeah, elevens. Well, I'm sure they're gonna do the right things. And you answer the, your own question. It's you know you can have the state of the art electronics and everything if you don't ask for the ID and the, Sounds like you're, uh, you do that. I put that to place probably about two or three weeks ago, but everybody had to be ID for cigarettes. Yeah. Tony? Yeah, could you just explain how that works? So somebody's going to scan in a bottle of wine or something, mm -hmm. and then you can't complete the sale without scanning? So you cannot complete the sale without putting it in an ID. Literally scan the barcode on the back of your license. So, so if you don't have a scan, you don't you don't get the sale. If you, don't have, if you don't have so an if you're ID. from South Carolina and it doesn't scan that that's your license, it won't take. It. Okay. And it, so it also looks for not only the age but also whether it's a, a fake ID or not. And the clerk is verifying what they see on the screen to what they actually see on the ID. So if it's different information, then clearly it's this you know, it's a fraudulent ID. Great, that sounds like a good system. Um, who is the ultimate responsible party? So if we do have an issue and we do have to, you know, talk to somebody who, so what's the what's the chain of, well, Mary Ellen's the manager. I would be the manager, so, so I would be the one that would be spoken to. Okay, so any any situation would come to you. Great, and then you report up to some of the people behind you. Yes. Who are, great, great.
Nope, no questions, I'll ask you. Being um, anxious, or rather, I, I certainly would like to see the system once it's in, because I think I don't think we have that in any of our stores in town. Um, we have the scanner. I know. I have the scanners tomorrow. They're already in place. To be able to have that uh, as a point of sale, to be able to eliminate if, you, if it doesn't work, so it's actually a nice threshold for people. I'll be there tomorrow. Oh, good. I'll stop by. Okay. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Other than the fact that we take it very yeah. seriously. And yes. So are Matt. Yeah, so we're, we're glad to see your, you've got these systems in place. Jim? As a public hearing, you must be questions. Any comments for or against from the audience? Right. Um, Right, and that's it. Are there any questions? And I'm still getting the audience. Are. are there any questions from the audience? Is this the same system, a uh, similar system as used at the supermarket for scanning IDs and validating those? It doesn't. It sounds familiar. It sounds to me the diff I'm not sure if the, the market has a. But it's not tied in with the sale there. They actually enter in after their machine. <coughs> it says right. or bad. But this is actually validating the ID. If you just your name and address also. I'm sorry, Mike Tibodeau, 40 Work Street, Central. So I think from, from the sound of it, when they scan it in, it stops the process for purchasing. Yes. Then they have to take the their card, scan the card. If the card is not legit or if there's a malfunction, they don't get the sale. They, they it's not, this is not requiring the judgment of the human doing this, no. offering the scanner yeah. to say whether it's too bad. It's the, right system, the, the system itself is validating the yes. ID. Yeah. That's great. I think this is the first yeah. effort of it in our town, and I'm like, that's you're setting the, uh, the gold standard, so to speak. Right? The, the operator needs to validate what's in his hands and what's on the screen. Correct. So that's the operator's job. He scans it, something will pop up on the screen, and he has to make sure the two will match. That's, so so it's like a final picture. approval, is that yes? I see. Yeah. So it has an the picture or often something else. Thank you. Well, the ID is the person standing in front of them. That's correct. That's, that's what, I and mean, it's got to match because it's in the system. Match. You know, I can take yeah. John's ID. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Seeing none, can I obtain a motion? Um, close the hearing. Yeah. Move to close the hearing? No. Okay. So, yeah. That'll close it. Okay. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve a transfer of license for a package store wine and malt beverage off premise annual license. Held by JBNJ Foods Incorporated doing business as 7-Eleven to 7-Eleven of Massachusetts Incorporated. The 2,920 square foot space is located at 337 Gannett Road, Situate, Massachusetts, and consists of 2,920 indoor area total square footage, one room with one entrance and two exits. Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Second. Mr. Harris. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, now we're going to move on for a discussion vote special event permits. And in particular, we're looking for the first one, which is Go for Life Family Fun Walk at the Situate Harbor Community Building. Uh, and our Director of Council on Aging, Hi. Hayes, good evening. So, what is this all about? What do you got going here? So, we're having a walk. Very excited about the idea. Uh, the Mass Council on Aging has. Uh, offered to grant funding for up to 40 communities, towns to do a, maybe start an annual event walk uh, for you know, several reasons, but especially to encourage, um, well, to celebrate, I guess, it's community celebration of walking, but to do it as a community, to um, do it with all the generations, if you could. So to encourage older adults who are currently walking and just to applaud their improvements um, and give them more opportunity to do that, but also to help them invite family friends. And then really to make it for us just an opportunity to be with community for gathering, for celebrating, um, really was a little bit multiple um, reasons for doing it. We have a new walking group, we've done it a few times. We have a trail walking group that's fairly regular and we actually just uh, were able to purchase through a grant from the Situate Education Foundation a set of 10 sets of Nordic <coughs> walking poles, which uh, Lisa Thornton, our activities coordinator, was instructed and is now helping instruct others to use them. So it's a workout. So it really was sort of an opportunity to highlight some of that and encourage that to continue among our population. But it's an accessible fitness option for all generations and just really a chance to kind of 
highlight and celebrate what seniors at the Senior Center is doing, um, showcase the walkability of our town in particular, so it was an easy route to determine. Actually, I had uh, communicated with the Chief uh, of Police just to see what he thought about it, and the first suggestion he had was for me to check the Patriot schedule, which I hadn't thought of myself, so that was really good. So in determining the date, it's one that they have uh, again that night. Um, but still, we really were just trying to find the right time for it as well. So after services in the morning, but before other afternoon um, afternoon activities. So we finally determined 11 a.m. So 11 a.m. We're also having it was an opportunity for the Council on Aging, which is announcing and initiating this um, new age-friendly movement here in town. So we were accepted into this network of age-friendly communities through AARP and the World Health Organization. So that's brand new. Um, town administrator has been, uh, uh, talked about it with Jim. And so we were accepted and now we needed something to help us kick it off and announce it to the community. So this really worked for doing that as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, so there'll be a representative from AARP and we may need some sort of town official to join us and sort of help celebrate and help accept the official certification from them for moving into this new phase. So where are you walking? Where is this so the route is, there's a one mile and a two mile route. We just decided that was nice. So from the Harbor Community Building, it's actually perfect to um, what I was calling the Sand Hills Rotary, not being from situated originally, but the sign. And then two miles is exactly to the lighthouse and back. So if they're just able or interested in doing the one mile option, it's really just around that and right back to the center and then um, the building. And then two miles is the lighthouse and back. Good. So we'll have um, music, uh, some games, um, a couple of other things planned, a treat, refreshments. So we'll have a little bit of a party back there so we have it until 1.30. One thing you might want to be aware of when you when you say you're going from the community center down to the end of Jericho, mm -hmm. and then back, that's mm -hmm. the one mile, but the two mile route, because there's no sidewalks, you might want DPW to make sure that they have signage, maybe no parking on one side, if you're gonna have people walk around there. Uh, I will, we did meet, <coughs> I did uh, check in with Sergeant Gilmartin, met with us the first time, and he gave us some tips, and actually, it was recommended that we use that kind of a route, I mean, it wasn't through the downtown, where we might have needed more detail, um, it does have some sidewalks, and then he just felt that it was friendly enough yeah. through the loop that staying on the sides. But there'll be instructions given during the announcements before him before they step off. So step off time is 11:30 in the morning, but we're gathering at 10:30. We're going to have the presentation and announcements at 11. And then at what 11:30, um, MTV at the community center for football. Watch the Patriots, well, well they, can, well, they have to watch the Patriots on until the evening. Oh, that's 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 good. <laughs> they can watch the other teams, but that's why it was a good date. So it's, I'm sorry, September 23rd uh, is the date good. for this. So it's a Sunday. Question: Rain or shine? Rain or shine? Yep, rain or shine. I'm afraid. I think that's the way it should be. Um, Any questions from the board? Don't see any. Entertain a motion. Moving to approve the special event permit to lend the Mayor's Constituent Council on Aging to the Go for Life Family Fund Hall on September 23rd, 2018, from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Motion by Ms. Canfield, seconded by Second Ms. Curran. Um, 1.30 is enough a good time for you to finish? Well, we had to. Uh, the Recreation Department is using the building at 2, so okay. we had to shift our time a little bit. Uh, there's something in the morning, so we're setting up a little bit. It's a window. Good. We can do that. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Linda, congrats. Thank you very much. When you need somebody from the board, I'm sure we'll I'd, I'd be happy to. I'd, great. I'd, I'd, John will run it. Or you could, uh, we could I can't do that. I my knee right now. Maybe <laughs> next year we'll expand into the run. Mile. A walk is good. All invited. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Real, real quick, if I could, I want to go back to the uh, seaside and close the way the counter asked the question. The remediation actually is part of this contract, the environmental, it's on the number 38, Perfect. and then it says LSP, Licensed Site Professional. Oh, okay. That's so I'm back with that. It's not a separate contract. It is in this contract for all the environmental remediation. It's about 
I thought it was included in the case schedule. Well, when you look at it, it says LSP, instead of engineer. Mm -hmm. That's all the license side professional. That's all the environmental remediation. Okay, great. I just want to correct that. Thank you. All right, going to move on to the next one, Alice's House Fund Run. Uh, Julie, come on up. Thank you. Can you give your name and address? <coughs> Julie Johnson, 260 South River Street, Marshville. And you're looking to have a fun run mm -hmm. on October 20th um, from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. And is it, did I see? Can I see five models? That were four point five. Four, four point five. Um, and you're starting at the you're starting at the uh, parking lot of the town. Or um, no, what we've done is uh, the Davis family owns the sand parking lot, yep. the dirt parking lot up by the opening. So we're going to do registration and set up there, and then have the uh, town parking lot reserve that for parking. Perfect. So keep that just parking, and then we'll take off. Um, <clears throat> we're going to. Register in the dirt parking lot and down, uh, gather everybody at a start at the post office and the town parking lot. Send them south down River Street, go down up around the loop of Ocean Drive, come back, go past the intersection at Marshfield Ave, and head up to the cliff. Get up to the fork and over the cliff and come back. But we'll have the finish line on the north side of that intersection, so they're not running through the intersection again. They'll end before it. Um, <clears throat> that way we're only pulling off traffic on the bridges coming into town for that. Is that the left when they go at Julian Street and then when that big the front runners get past it, which should be about ten minutes. Um, and then when they pass through again at Marshall Ave. So they'll only hit the bridges once. Gotcha. It's just the first time I stay. this looks like the first time I've For it Alice's too. house. Um, I organized it when it was back in 98 when we did the um, Portland Gale, 100 year anniversary of the Portland Gale. Um, and we did it for about five or six years in a row. And then the brain aneurysm group, uh, Christine, I can't remember her last name, she ran it just more recently, I think from like 2010 to 14 or so. So she's done it more recently and she's actually jumped on to help with this one. So there's been a few going on for the last. And I think we revived it in 98. We were told we were reviving something from the 1960s and 70s. So it keeps coming back. Oh, well, it's a natural path. It's a nice flat run. <laughs> um, the road, Jim, do we know if Kevin, I don't know if here, but um, yeah, Central is kind of, is that road going to be, I don't know, after all the storms, if there are any holes and everything patches in the for the runners? Um, you know, it, it, I drove it the other day again, and it's not too bad. They've really done a lot with all the plowing and regrading of each residence along the way. Um, it's kind of refilled itself, but um, it's not paved, or it's not repaved, so it's not fresh. But I think a lot of the people that want to know it. Okay. Questions from the board? Yeah. Could you, um, I was looking for the uh, backup, but could you tell us about Alice's house a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, Alice's house is one of the homes that burnt down in 2012, the four houses that burnt on that March day when it, the wind carried the mm -hmm. fire. Um, it's, uh, it was originally a home owned by Alice Feeney. She and her husband ran it, not uh, didn't rent it, they owned it and lived in it, but they would rent it um, or actually just let people use it for kind of a respite purpose. Um, they were involved in um, cancer support groups, AA meetings, they would let them use their house. It just has a lot of good mojo in that house because it's always been a healing place. So when it burned down, um, Alice had passed on a few years before that, and Janet Gibson had purchased it as a foundation um, and was able to run it so that in the summer it gets rented at market price to the public. And then uh, that money helps sustain it September through June. So if somebody needs the home to just have a place to go because they've got a family member suffering or struggling, um, we can let them stay there and they can make a donation if they can afford it and if they can't, they can still stay there. Oh, that's so we were able to rebuild it 
um, after it burnt down, only because we rebuilt the board of directors. Um, I actually did the design for the new house and stayed on the board of directors, and now we're trying to just pay off those construction costs. So we're almost there. That's great. Good, good cause. Yes. It is very good. Cause. Thank you. I have a brochure if you'd like it. Yeah. Motion. Well, that's amazing. I, I didn't know that's I just asked Karen. I never heard of that. Oh, it's kind of Alice's house. Right below the radar on that. that that's, yeah. That, that. It's been there for a long, long time. I grew up in Hamrock and I knew it was there, but I'd never been there. And then um, when it burnt down and I was asked to come and help with the redesign to rebuild, I got very interested and ended up joining. As did many, the attorney, uh, Jeff DeLisi, is on the board with us. And everybody that got involved in the rebuild ended up staying on. That's, good. That's yeah. a great story. Yes. Well, thanks for asking, Mark. I just assumed it was an organization in Boston or something like that. No, no, it's right so, here. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, it's very good. Great. <coughs> Motion? Move to approve a special event permit to Julie Johnson, Alice's house for the, for the Alice's House fund run on October 20th, 2018, from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Motion by Ms. Canfield, second. Second, Mr. Harris. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congrats. Thank you. Good luck. Yes. Next, going to move over to Stop Cancer Now. Previously, click the challenge. Thank you, Julie. Ladies, how are you? So you we have a yeah. name, and I think if I'm not mistaken, a change of start. Start and finish um, the route um, after we. Is it okay if I go? Yeah, go ahead. Actually, could you identify yourself for us? Sharon Tassini, 138 Vernon Road, Anne Marie Winchester, 277 Philly Garden Street, Ian Dutter. Yes. Um, after our meeting the last time, um, and thinking about the route, um, you had some concerns about the crossing of the driftway. And right. we act, I actually started to think about that and walk the road. Um, and we started doing some experimenting and um, came up with a route that does not cross um, the driftway and allows us more parking. Okay, so I went and had a meeting with Officer Bill Martin, and he was very, very, um, I guess, eager for me to look at that second group because the first one would have been very costly. Yeah. So he was, um, he said he was going to notify the, the selectman that he was in favor of the second group. Um, so that would change the start and finish to Peggy Beach. Um, he was not concerned about it being that it's a town beach with the beach stickers. He was yeah. okay with that being October 13th. Yeah, I don't worry about that. Um, and as far as the name change, um, the Cliff Challenge was a race that was previously held, and I did reach out to those folks that did the race, um, and they asked me to not call it the Cliff Challenge, so in honor of that, um, our race was the Cliff I like Challenge. Name. I like the new name, Thank and you. I, I think that's, that's great, and it says what it is. It says what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So everything else is the same. Um, so I have applications if you'd like them. <laughs> you know what, I will take one. <laughs> so we, I can start walking to find it. They're talking about it. Well, you can walk it too. I'm having problems right now. But um, I'm very happy that you did that because obviously the details are expensive and, and obviously it's about trying to generate as much money for your cause and, and then um, see some safety issues. So I'm glad you were able to work that out. Um, and also, is there a way that the town administration fee for the detail can be waived since it's a big fundraiser? I, I, that, um, we'd have to ask the board. Um, we have, uh, about waiving the administration fee. Um, the difficulty we have is we've only done that on like town events like uh, St. Patrick's Day parade. We've done it for Harris Day, and I'm not sure what else we've done it for. Tony, Sean, anybody else might remember. I'm not sure if it's for the school. I think it was just recently. Uh, but what's that, Tony? And that's only because it's for the whole town, yeah. primarily. And if you were to do it for your event, I, 
I understand. Fair, everybody's going to be asking. Can't, for you can't. No. Can't get it unless you ask. I, I so, really thank you. I'm trying to cut my overhead. Okay. Um, so I, the answer short answer is no. But that being said, any questions from the board? Do you want clarification of the roof at all? Um, we, uh, my just my design, uh, picture here is not clear. So the short roof goes around second cliff, out to first cliff maybe. Yes. And then the longer run goes, um, takes a turn at the church at the. Uh, at the, the Parish Center. Parish Center and goes down to where? Gilson. And then goes up Gilson and then down towards the golf course. So it doesn't go down Collier. It goes down towards the golf course, then to Kent Street, and then back on the driftway back to Peggy. Old driftway. Yeah. Oh, I thought I was down Crest. I forget it looks like it goes up uh, Gilson and then you probably come around. And, by, the and then uh, Gilson, you'll come back down um, Driftway and then you come to Old Kent Street yes. to connect with yeah. Kent Street. And then uh, back. That's what it looks like. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you anticipate having to block off the street? How many runners do you estimate? At, at this point, I, I would say that no, you're not going to need to do any road closure of any type. Uh, there's a pretty good wide shoulder on that side of the road. I would talk to the police ahead of time. Um, because uh, the driftway is a nice wide road, you won't even have to cross the runners at any point. Uh, if they take that first turn onto Gilson, by the time the lead runners are coming back down Kent and back onto the driftway, everybody will be off. All of the outgoing runners will be off the main road. So you're still going to be yeah, we're, we're probably going to be 100, maybe 150 runners within the first mile. They're going to be running single file. Okay. So you might think about easy. either, um, see if, the, if you either have more um, DPW cones or saw horses. Yeah. Okay. Because there is a association <coughs> lane there for cycles, bike yes. lane. The downside is you don't want bikers coming, bike cyclists coming down. Right. You might want to. That. And that's one of the things I'll talk to the police about ahead of time. I just like to check before I use any type of traffic cones. Yep. Um, also, Officer Bill Martin um, encouraged me, and I certainly will do this, to notify all of the folks along the road. And I mean, I'll put something on social media, I'll put something in the paper, and I will put a flyer in their mailbox okay, to let them know that um, this is coming up and encourage them to participate. Um, before they get the coffee. Good. 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 Motion. Move to approve a special event permit to Sharon Tassini for the Stop Cancer Now Road Race on October 13, 2018 from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. pending receipt of Certificate of Liability Insurance. Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Vignani. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Congratulations. I just want to reiterate, I, I think you really have to check with the police because that could be dangerous with 150 runners. Um, that, Officer Bill Martin, he he was okay with it. He was a little more concerned about the walkers um, than the runners, but the walkers will be going on the driftway. And if there are walkers in the five in the, in the five mile, I mean, I run and walk at the same time. Um, he wasn't as concerned about that. Yeah, we'll, we work pretty closely with them so that if he wants, wherever he wants us to have volunteers to make sure that the runners are staying within that cone lane and they'll allow us to do that. I own all the cones, so it's it's not a matter of being able to get access to them. If they allow us to do that, we will have volunteers making sure that the runners are staying in there. And I, I agree that the walkers are more of a problem because they only get their coffee, they walk four across the road and don't really pay attention to what's going on as opposed to the runners just Quick. once they start they just the faster you go the quicker it's over I guess. Um, so thanks it's, it's just those walk four across walkers good ladies thank you very much that's thank it you. and all the best thank all you right. thank, thank you. you thank you now we're going to move on to a discussion vote community choice aggregation and i see lisa scanlon here sustainable south shore Good evening. Good evening. Lisa Scanlon, 15 Poplar Ave, uh, 
Sitwick, and Lisa Bortola, 52 Elm Street, Sitwick. And thank you very much for inviting us back to uh, revisit the conversation about community choice aggregation for Sitwick. Uh, we are looking um, to hopefully get this, um, the articles for the community choice aggregation on the special town meeting uh, for the fall. Um, if, if you don't mind, Lisa was just going to review just very briefly what community choice aggregation is. So the Mass General Laws allow communities in Massachusetts to go out to bid for their own power sourcing and um, this allows the community to go out to bid at different times of the year that power companies uh, are not allowed to go out to bid at. So that affords an that allows an opportunity to get the best rates, um, better rates even than the power um, uh, distributors can do. So it's an opportunity that's out there for, for these uh, communities in, I think right now, six cities in, in the country, Massachusetts being one of them, and many cities and towns have already taken advantage of this in Massachusetts, including the city of Boston, Rockland, and next door, um, and approximately 30 or so other cities and towns. Um, so we're hoping that for the special town meeting, uh, the enabling language, which allows the Board of Selectmen to at least move forward with the process and, and explore those um, opportunities for both financial reasons, which would uh, provide our power uh, in a competitive pricing uh, uh, way, give us the best price for the power, but also to maybe make room for some class one renewables um, if, if we could make it affordable. So just pers you know, pursuing that process, the enabling language uh, would be the first article. And then there would be another article where um, we as, as the town's uh, kind of renewable energy and uh, sustainability uh, group would say if, if there is room to put in more class one renewable green power, um, certainly I think this community has already been exemplary in terms of the municipal power with the turbine and the solar array. So it seems fitting to make it possible for residents to opt for more green options um, for residential businesses in the town. So that's it in a nutshell. There's, there's more details. It, it's cost free to the town. The brokers who do the RFP process are paid through the rates that ultimately are paid um, with the power suppliers, it's, it's a mandated fee um, in the legislation that the broker gets paid not by the town but through the power suppliers. So it's no cost to the town to, to embark in this process and it can potentially lead to um, more cost effective power. Questions from the board? Karen? Uh, just a couple. So I understand I've been reading the back up with the broker and, and, and trying to get competitive rates. I, I was just a little curious about the way it was worded about down the road. How do we, how do we make sure that we are revisiting to make sure that the pricing is competitive and um, that it, become, it remains a good deal for the town? So the way it works, uh, it's usually on two year, um, that's how it would work. And so that every two years, it's automatically revisited. Um, and the other question I had, it was a little confusing about the requirements on public meetings and information. Would that come after, like the first phase is just to give permission to proceed? Correct. So we would have this vote, but there wouldn't be public meetings before? No. Okay. That's a little weird because it's, you know, well, the public meetings um, are, much, are more about, okay, this is what we, we've got yes, the brokers, this is what we found, we can get this much in um, past one renewables, this, you know, what our rates would be, um, you know, let's, you know, okay, so this is step one about. just to start the homework. Exactly, just to be able to even speak to the brokers and to, to create opportunity. Um, we met with Lisa and Lisa <laughs> um, and really received a good deep dive with regards to the benefits and I think it makes a lot of sense for us to start moving forward in the process. So any relief that we can give our residents 
um, in their electricity bills and also controlling that. I think something that you two both brought up to us during our meeting, which I thought was important, is that there are a lot of folks out there knocking on people's doors already, selling renewable energy uh, source plants that may not be the best rates. So this gives us an opportunity to uh, monitor that a little bit better um, and bring it under the town's control. And folks can go in and out at their at their leisure. So I think this makes sense, A, from a renewable aspect, and also B, obviously, from a cost aspect, to give our residents any relief that we possibly can um, and choice with regards to where they get their energy. So I'm all supportive of moving forward. So not really a question, just I guess it's a long statement. Well, thank you. Is there a downside? Is there a downside? A downside? Yes. I would brainstorm this and a lot trying to um, come up with any we, we weren't able to. Um, it really is about control, more, more local control of the power sourcing. Um, so I, I don't think, yeah. I don't see the downside. Because like, I think Tony and I think yourself, you said shop your electricity now and you may not get the best price. Right. So you think by adopting this, you know, those folks that might not monitor it as close. Right, and the people who want to still, they still can do that. They just right. opt out of this and yeah, residents exactly that what they're already. The yeah. resident would be allowed to opt out or go back in or opt out as many times and as frequently as they want with no penalty, whereas a lot of green contracts that are out there lock you in for at least a two or three year period and the rates are variable so you get subject to a fixed higher rate um, so we've heard actually it's sustainable so sure of a lot of horror stories where people tried to do the right thing but got locked into a financially uh, tough situation with green power. Uh, the goal of this isn't necessarily rate savings, but it is to align our community values with with our power sourcing, but also obviously rate savings are a great value added bonus if that can be done. And we can charge the town, not we, but the town can charge the broker with any mandates, say, you know, we want, you know, to stay within the default, you know, basic service rate of national grid by X percent, and yet still slip in some renewables if we can. The town can mandate all the parameters of this contract. Nothing is a done deal until the options are before the board of selectmen. There's nothing, no obligation. You can back out of this until any, something is signed. Tony? Yet, um, <clears throat> just a couple questions. So, the, how does the town? Is that the way that you feel the town has control by putting parameters around the broker? Mm -hmm. So we could say the price has to be less than National Grid's rate right now. You can put those parameters in there. Okay. So the one, the one problem that I have with it, and I, I like the Green Initiative. I like it. I just don't know where our role of selectmen is in allowing someone to take over all of the electricity services for the town and then forcing a citizen to opt out of something. So they're, they're currently with whoever they're with. That's right? currently the case though. With National Grid, the default service is not a voluntary option. The default is the default. It's that would them. be the same situation. Right. But, well, that's not us. You know, we're not in the electricity business. That's. I, I get electricity and I get it from, um, what was it, Con, uh, consultation. Who's Clint? No, I don't remember the name, but from some aggregator. Um, but now what would happen is if we sign this, every, every resident in the town is going to have to get this unless I go and say I don't want this. No, so don't they have existing contracts don't get touched. If you're on the default service, yeah, your default underlying plan would move to this unless you opt it out. But if you're in an existing power contract with a different supplier, your contract is sacred and it won't be touched. And again, I'm all for the green initiative. I just, I'm questioning our ability to say, okay, everybody that has default coverage with whoever you have, we've changed it. Well, it's not with whoever you have. You have our national grid customer default straight. Okay, so you're a national grid, because you choose national grid. You know. So you, you have National Grid, and now the Board of Selectmen have, have decided that you don't have National Grid anymore, and you have whoever this broker is, 
Yeah. But it's, they won't actually, they still get the bill from National Grid, the, the lines are still owned by National Grid, everything's still National Grid, it's just that the actual energy is coming. It's the source, the not the distribution no, I, system. I, I, I understand how it works. I'm just saying, from a high level, I've just told Sean, who has National Grid default, that you don't anymore. You have Tony's energy. And if you don't want it, then you gotta you gotta actually say I don't want it. And I just I feel like it's a little bit backwards. I like the idea of offering it to the residents, but for them opting in as opposed to having to opt out is is my question. And I it, it, am I maybe I'm misconstruing. In other words, by passing the aggregate uh, community aggregate uh, choice aggregate uh, aggregation, we're giving the ability to opt out of your contracts. Uh, immediately, in other words, I have national grid. So if this gets passed, I have to opt out of national grid in order to do it. No, no. Just the opposite. default for national grid would seamlessly switch over to whatever the board of selectmen yeah. sign on. Mm -hmm. Once the contract is presented to the board that is amenable, that meets all the parameters, that would be a seamless switch. And, and it'd be an outreach program that would educate residents that as of this date, your default, if you're on the default for national grid, we're going to switch over to our aggregation, which is a local aggregation that we went out to bid for, is going to seamlessly switch. If you don't want that, you can say no thank you. There's either a 1-800 number, it's a very simple no thank you option, uh, and you can stay with National Grid's default. But it's like right now, no one is asked right now by National Grid, do you want the default? You just get it. So that would not change. It's just that the town has decided that the default now becomes a more locally controlled and potentially greener option, but it is a seamless switchover as of a certain date. So if someone does have to go the extra step to opt out of that if they don't want it. And statistically, the reason for that, the legislation was brought about originally, is because the numbers show that when someone has to opt into something, because they're busy and they have daily lives that are all encumbersome, they don't educate and learn enough and make that step, even if they wanted to, even if they, their intentions were in line with what, uh, whatever that was represented. So the legislation was set up that the default does switch over to whatever the town has worked long and hard to obtain as the default. Someone has to go the extra step to opt up. But it's a very simple process, and there is an educational outreach beforehand so that people understand that. The hope is when you set up the requirements, that when you finish this process, number that comes out is less than the national grid default. So even though you're mandating that someone goes into it, they're going to get a lower price. They're not going to say well, change. You're not guaranteeing that. I mean, no. If the, the wild card is if you go, if you say, I want a new energy number, and you go to bid, an energy company almost going to guarantee you is going to give the town a lower number than the national grid default. It's when you start saying, I want 20% renewables, I want 25% renewables, that number starts moving. Or more likely, what if it's just the same rate? What if they're even? What if it's not a savings? What if it's the same rate as basic service, but it's locally controlled, there's consumer protection, and there's a green option? What do you think most residents would say? Yeah, and I'm not against any of that. I'm just wondering what our role as selectmen is in telling people what energy they should use. Well, it would also and go to Because if I was the broker, I would love this, right? I just got 9,000 customers automatically by signing a contract. And and I'm not saying we don't do it, I'm just saying I think we have to think about it. Um, well, I'm sure there's someone in, involved in the default power right now that's happy that people don't pay attention and opt out of default power as well. You know, I'm sure there's people in the oil or fuel industry that are excited when people don't opt out of the default power. Right, and again, I'm just wondering what's our role as the five of us here. Um, yeah, it's funny, the other thing I point out, when you get to the end, you get a price, you can say no. Yeah, but someone, has to, someone has to make the effort to, to get out of it. I, I yeah. well, my point is, when you go through this whole process, you set your parameters, and I'm just going to, we want 25% renewable, we want this, we want this, we want this. The broker goes out. Send it out to the market, the energy producing companies come back and say, This is the number. And you look at the number and say, We don't like it, it's too high. We just don't accept it. 
if energy, no plans or energy prices are acceptable, there is no obligation for the town to proceed. It's right here in the document. So if the number comes out 15 and the default is 14, you say we're not going to proceed. I understand. So let, let's say the five of us were, were very green and we said we don't care about the price. We just want it to be 75% green. So all of a sudden we've just, and the price for green is 20% more than what our current residents are paying for the default, then their energy is going to be automatically changed to that unless they go and opt out. If you proceed with the contract. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's why I just want to talk about it before we... But isn't that, may, may I ask for a point of clarification, isn't this just, so this piece of it is just to do all this research, to say yes, we want to go forward special town meeting, get approval to start researching and working with the broker and finding out what those rates are. When that all that information comes back to us, we're not just going to sign a contract. It's going to go back in front of town meeting to be approved. So, I mean, I agree with you. There's got to be some sort of cost savings in my mind and renewables. That would be my objective. So it's still going to be up to the townspeople at town meeting to accept the plan to move forward or not. So it's not like this particular step automatically is saying we're moving forward and no well, choices are being I given. I guess that's my question. What is the town voting on? Are they voting on the actual contract? No. No, they're just voting on the initiative. Right. So if three of us were over the top green and said we want it to be 100% renewable, then this would happen because town has given us the ability to negotiate the contract. We negotiated the contract when we wanted to, and we've just done whatever we wanted to, everyone's electrical. Right, but at most cities and towns that are um, have gone forward with a green initiative have uh, been very sensitive to, to residential rate um, you know, sensitivity. Um, and that if they wanted uh, an excessively green option to be out there for their residents, what they've done is they've provided two choices as Part of this program, in other words, you know, one that's within the same rate of the basic service for, that the utility currently offers, that offers maybe only five percent green additional green power, and then there's a hundred percent renewable option that costs ratepayers more, but they have to opt for that. So, like the town of Acton did that, they have, you know, one that's much more in keeping with the current rate. You know, it's a mix of, of energy sourcing. And then another one that's for the real green people in the, in the town that want to go 100% renewable. And that is a more costly option, but it's up to the resident to choose it. At least this way, with aggregation, the town is using a broker to vet out a sound two, three year contract with consumer protections. It makes all those door to door, you know, door knockers that are peddling green energy kind of disappear because people know, oh no, my town's got my back. I know my options, I can be greener if I want, or I can stay with, you know, close to the current mix for about the same rate, if not less, which is a great, you know, thing if that can work. But there are protections at least, it's more What are the protections? The, well, the protection is that the rate is guaranteed and it's as competitive as of the date the contract is signed, if not better, whatever the terms are at the time the town signs the contract. It is, you know, the best rate at that time, and that it'll come up for renewal in two or three years, but it's a no. Right. Um, well, that's what my, I have with my uh, whatever company I have. With. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no protection, it's just a contract for two years. Where well, at least, like, we've heard horror stories where some people that went with green options, the rate was variable, and right. the rate ran up, and then they were locked in for three years and said, I can't afford this anymore. I want to go back to National Grid's default, but I can't get out of this contract without a penalty. There's no penalties here to get out of it. A, a resident can opt in and out with no penalty if they don't like it, or if they want to go even greener with another third party, they can still do that. But at least this freedom, and the town has done their best to do this competitive bid process with both ratepayers and community values in line. Again, I'm all for the green initiative. I just don't know of any situation where we've gone in and impacted a personal bill that somebody gets for their, you know, for their, for their homes. Well, if it's a savings, I would assume you're out for all the champions and heroes. And if it's not, they have absolutely every 
option to be not part of it by saying no thank you. And we, we are committed, so, so sure, we would help with the outreach as we did with the wind turbine, as we, you know, we've, we're committed to getting outreach and any educational uh, information out there. There's all sorts of whiteboard presentations that we can do websites and things to help people. Okay. Again, I'm not, I'm really not to, um, talking about your product and your initiative. I, I like it. I think it's great. I'm talking about what our role as selectmen should and shouldn't be for utility. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, um, it's, um, it may not be this board, it may be future boards, and what it will do. And I think you do get a point where we're not experts in the utility field, so it kind of puts a burden on us as a board that we make a mistake, we choose something. That obviously, people have to be aware of the rates, what, what they're opting to, to utilize. Um, and if it turns out it's something they don't like, then they have to opt out. Not every resident is going to be watching their utility bill to figure out whether they can get better options or something like that. So I do see the potential flaw um, on that. I actually thought that if, if we did this and we had to opt in, that's a better way of doing because then you're in the default then you opt in to getting into what we think as a town would be a better thing, but it doesn't actually, it, it does have, um, I think it does have. Well, the town made a decision back a while ago to have a renewable energy committee. I'm not sure what happened with that committee to spearhead the wind turbine and the solar array for municipal power. And the Mass General Laws, obviously the state, the Commonwealth made a decision to enable communities to do this because they knew that local, local grassroots efforts to look at power supplies were important to becoming a more sustainable Commonwealth. So as I think the appetite for this in our community is huge. I know that. I've been surveying people's appetite for these types of things for many years. I was here with Al Banger when the turbine came up and they thought no one would approve that. And it, it, it worked. I mean, people actually care. We are a coastal community. 2017 storm damages were huge. Um, we have a lot of reason to be on the forefront of uh, clean power. I won't go into those reasons, but I think the appetite's huge. I think it's a great opportunity that the Mass General Laws enable us to do, to, to take on. Um, Sean? Any experience in any of other towns, Jim, with this? Linfield No, Linfield was a uni, so they had municipal power and deposit towns, so not eligible for this. <coughs> no, we didn't do the municipal aggregation for Anybody, but we did bid on energy for the town buildings, for the town gas, for the town electricity. That came out very well. So we went on the. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I know a lot of the towns that do it. Um, you know, I think what the board has to set is you want to make sure that when you get to the end, the rate's going to be either the same or lower. Because then there's no damage, lack of better term, to the, to the homeowner. I think most people don't even look. They don't know where their energy comes from. They don't know if they're the default or if they signed up. They thought they're getting the load of signing. They, they're getting electricity from somebody else. I mean, it just it comes to your house. I think that's what most people it comes to your house. The town of Rockland just approved this. Do we, what do we? Go ahead. I just have one more question. Yeah. Do we have the option to to switch in? In our town, we we want it to be an opt-in and not an opt-out. You know, we can't have that simple little yeah, well, tweet. Well, do it like because it doesn't behoove them because the smaller percentage, you know, think to the rates won't be as good. Because they, the, the company's bidding on a pool right, like a pool. just like yeah, it's opt in, they, they're not sure of the pool looks right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they have data that says if the pool's this big, we get a loss of X percent, so they know how much electricity they're actually going to have to supply. Jim, that's the same reason you just said. We would just change 9,000 people's bills, and 4,000 wouldn't know, they wouldn't care. And, you know, this company's brokers now got 4,000 customers because nobody looks at the utility company. Right, but again, I'd say it's probably closer to 8,900 wouldn't care, wouldn't notice as the 9,000 because most people don't Unless know. And the people that know are already someplace else. <clears throat> like you're already someplace else. You went and did the work. Most people don't do the work. 
look at it and they go, lights on, I'm good. I'm not going to bother going through this whole rig world to try to find more electricity because I don't know. It could go up, could go down. Light comes on, I'm good. They confuse the supply, and the distribution. You know, if I get rid of national grid and the tree falls down, it's going to come with the wire back up. We get into all that. But if, if you structure it right, it should be a win for the consumer. And if it's not, you can just say, no, we're not going to go forward. Karen? Just, this is just another question for you, Jim. Um, I get what Tony's saying. Is there any mechanism that could put um, control on future boards to not, you know, to work with certain parameters? You know? yeah. Yeah. So you, you will have a contract that you've got up and purchased energy for for a set period of time. You will then have to go out and procure it again at the end of that time. So a new board can come in and say, as, as Tony's been saying, we're the greatest board in the country. We want 100% for our residents. Well, that, that's my question, though. Is there any, has ever, have we ever, has there ever been an issue that the town instructs the board on, a, on parameters? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, like a town meeting article? <coughs> or a, you could, but it's not binding. Yeah, okay. So the, the town authorizes the board to issue debt. The town can't require the board to issue debt. So, or limit it. So they can give you instructions on this. I mean, I would think the goal of it for the board would be to come out with, if you wanted to have a green plan, you'd have a green plan, but you'd want a plan that would come out at the end. The default plan would be cheaper than what people are paying now. That's what I think you'd want to do. And then a green plan over here, look, if you want 100% renewable, here's your plan. You can go up and take this. And it's solar, it's, it's wind, it's tides, whatever. But I think the, the end game for this board, anyways, would be hey, we did this, it's got some green in it, but in the end, it's cheaper than what you're paying now. And the legislation requires a very robust public outreach. Is, is that yes, correct? and then brokers, um, they're responsible. Yes. Yeah. So why don't we do this? Sounds like we may not be enough. Move to take a vote on this tonight. This is just the enabling language. I just want to reiterate, and yeah. it's really important. This is just to move forward with exploring the process of getting a broker and moving forward with going out to bid and, and putting the parameters around it. It would really just be the enabling language at this point to, to explore it. So what I'm saying is, this is to, to add it to our fall special town meeting to the morning. And I was going to say, is this something that we want to put on tonight or we want to put it on our next meeting on September 4th? Or it's going to be open at that time. So I further, we can further. Can I ask you one more question, Sean? Yeah. So can you opt out at any point in time and opt back? So one day you can opt in, yeah. one day you can opt out. When you, yeah. So, I mean, obviously the worst case scenario would be we change somebody's rates for a two-year contract. It's comparable to national grid default. And then the next day they drop their default to Something lower. Something lower. The guy doesn't know about it for two years. Comes back to us and says, hey, you forced me to take this thing. And no one uh, forced him. Right? No one forced him. He could always opt out. He was, no, we made the decision to buy him, though. They're going to see the He'll know that in advance. He will know that in advance. Well, not, they're not. obligated it's not. Yeah. No, but to, to Tony's point is you get, a, you get a, a rate that's cheaper than the default national grid. And then all of a sudden, season change, you know, eight, nine months later, it drops national grid. And now our, the town's default is, is higher, and it's for the duration. And then two years go by, and they go, wait a minute, it was cheaper, but now you've made me spend all this. I could have been on national grid and save money. That's what we're going to hear from people or future boards would hear. They'll be like, you know, so that's why I, I think it's a, I think it's something that we, we as a board, and here's the other thing, to your point, the board is you know, going to be saddled with making these decisions which are good from a policy standpoint, green and clean energy, I get that. But, um, you know, it's, it's a big step for the board to have that power, if you will. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm happy to vote on it tonight, but I'm also, if you want to wait two weeks, just, and then talk to people, and then we'll bring it back and put it on the agenda to have a, a final vote to put it on the... Uh, I don't have the default rate, but I just did a search for power, 0266. 
the rates I'm looking at right now, 13.5, 12.29, the latest aggregation that I've seen was Advocate, which is 11.057. So just, if you do it right, you structure it correctly, it's going to be a lower price. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough the ability to go out to bid at a time of the year that the power companies are not allowed to go out to bid at. It's the timing issue. We can get the same, we can get power for less as a community. Right, that's something the broker has to look at. He has to look at the market and say, now's the time to lock in. And then you, you basically, you're betting whether the gas goes up or down. We'll have to come to mind and wait until the fourth just to put on a special time meeting if folks need to think about it some more. How's the board feel? Yeah, it wouldn't make any difference if we put it off one meeting. I mean, Karen, just to look at that. I could, but I, I also think that you know, this is just so we can start doing the homework. We're not committing to anything. Right. Um, so I, I don't see the downside of actually. Well, we're actually going to try and put it on on the warrant. Right. Then, right. then you go and 110 people show up and right. it's voted, and then. That's just to move forward. That's just to do the homework. Yeah. It's still just, this it's is just to explore what our parameters would be and what we would want to put out. Exactly. No, but that's the logical next step, right? I mean, you're not going to get it voted at town meeting if you're not going to do it. So then we come up with parameters. I don't think that's true. I think that if they go to the end of the day and they say, yeah, it's going to cost you $15, we're going to go, yeah, never mind. Yeah, there's nothing binding at that point. It's just that you could explore the process. No contracts or you can walk away. Okay, I understand. Yeah. I think I Tony's point is, yes, we can explore the process and walk away, but a, a board of selectmen, not so this board, but a board of selectmen can go through the whole process and lock people in at a rate that may not be your advantage to them. And I don't, I, don't, I like the initiative. I, I would probably vote in favor. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page with we want to take control of people's electric, electrical source. Okay. And, um, you know, and we can justify it by saying, yeah, I went before the town meeting and all 125 of you voted in favor of it. <laughs> so that's why we changed 9,000 people's power bill. Um, you know, we could, we could justify it and we would say the broker went out and did his due diligence in terms of educating people that were flyers or whatever went on. Um, I just think we all need to think about whether we want to do that. So I'd say, why don't we wait until the next meeting to vote on this, this issue? It's not saying no. It's just that I think, you know, for us to kind of go out talk to maybe our neighbors and friends and see what kind of feedback we have. Um, the only point of clarification I would make is that you're not deciding your power. You're simply changing the default from whatever contracts and negotiations were done with the power distributors, such as National Grid, to make their default what it is. And who knows what goes behind that. We have, we rather than making that decision, we are. but you're I, not forcing By changing the default, today. we've changed their power source. If they're on the default. If they're on the default. Do you know how many people in situ at all? Probably, the majority, but I don't know the number. So we just changed the majority of people's mm -hmm. power. And that happens annually through National Grid anyway. So let's do this. I, I've got to move on our agenda. So I'd like to see if we bump this again. Um, it's not saying we're not going to support it, it's just I think we need to think a little bit longer on it. Um, otherwise, we could be talking about this for another half hour. Would it be helpful to have um, some <coughs> contacts from the, some of the other towns and Don and stuff? Sure, I mean, for our next meeting, that would be fine. Um, all right, is so that okay with the board? Yes. Thank you. Right. So that being said, we have another one. We have the uh, next one, which is a discussion of old plastic bag. Lisa, are you solo then on this one? No. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> brother team. <laughs> so since last we've talked, um, you've given us a proposal for a, a motion for the warrant, actually a, a warrant article, to be able to ban the plastic bag. And you'd like to have that for the fall special town meeting. Yes. Um, and just, we did do our homework as well. Um, a few of you had asked that we reach out to some of the major um, 
businesses that would be affected by this. Uh, so we went to Village Market in particular and spoke with Ray Peterson, the manager, and uh, he, was, he was actually great. He walked in, he's like, I've been waiting for this to happen. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, the owners have already had already been discussing um, incentives that they can give to uh, customers for bringing their own bag in. Um, because that's definitely what our you know role would like to be, and is going planning to be. And we spoke to Ray about that. Is doing real community outreach. Is bring your own bag. This is not a paper versus plastic um, thing. It's really about the uh, importance of bringing your own bag and thus you know, negating the use or need for the plastic bags. Um, so he was very supportive. He said. You know, yes, you can have tables set up out front here. You know, it really was on board. So we were delighted about that. We went to a few other like restaurants that still use them, and they again were just like, yeah, you get paper bags. It's not. It's really not a. Um, that sense. Um, All right. So, questions from the board? Any on this? I'm I'm in support of putting it on the uh, warrant, so I'm I'm happy to put that on. I as well. So, you're going to go to the supermarket in the harbor and get, if you don't have your own bags, you'll have to you, you know, they'll provide paper bags? Yes. Any idea where you know, we recycle a lot of those bags? You know, right now we get plastic. Let's say we get all plastic bags, no paper at all percentage of people that recycle those versus put them inside of the two dollar bags that we buy or the rest the recycle of the which well how many people are recycling those small column like a two gallon bag with the handles that's what most the plastic are. bags right. like, actually get recycled yeah it's less than five percent they get recycled yeah so there's such, there's such a challenge because the only place you can even bring them now is two supermarkets that actually accept them. Right. And then if there are any, if there's any dirt on them, if there's any anything, and, and you actually just very, throw them away. There's very few things you can do with those things after you uh, take the groceries out. So they end up in the bucket bag, two bucks a bag, whatever. I don't buy the bags, but the bags that we provide, pay as you throw. So those small bags end up in the larger bags. Yeah, or in the ocean or floating around the trees, you see. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I don't even pick them out of them, right? So I'm just trying to, just trying to figure out all that. So 98% of those end up with sea mass, they get burned. I, I, I don't really have a problem with just trying to follow them along that so. yeah. My only question was, who's going to enforce it? It was the Board of Health. So the board help will go and monitor so someone will probably complain, you know, make a complaint that someone's using a paper bag, a plastic bag to the board help and then they would go and investigate. That or they're coming they go in for their I don't know how often they go in monthly, weekly, to the generally you know, go into the store for you know, the um, reasons why they do and then we'd be happy to their then we put in the um, <laughs> The warrant or the article, sorry, for the different offenses, the first offense, written yeah. things, second yeah. offense. Did anyone you talked to mention the, the difference? Because they're going to have to provide some sort of a bag. So they'll provide a brown paper bag instead of a plastic bag, I guess, like a grocery store or something. Yeah. Did anyone mention the cost between the two and that was a problem to them? Or? They did not. They did not because he, he emphasized, they emphasized, or every person we spoke to emphasized the fact that, oh, well, we're, we really want people to bring their own bag. Right. So eventually, the cost it, it's, it's cost savings for them. And the village market sells its own recyclable, multi-use bags yeah, on site. Cool. So if you forget one, you can buy one. Right yeah, we'll but they will they will have to have paper bags. Correct. You know, and restaurants, whatever they're going to use for for carry out, will have to provide something. No one mentioned that this is ten cents compared to a penny or anything like that. No, because they, they said they. Yeah, you're correct. They have them. But as well, as they're in the end, they're like we will be using less bags. We will have to be spending less on bags because people will be bringing them. Sean, is there a negative environmental impact if you to a paper bag that we throw away? Really, not. It's actually probably not a bad thing. 
Because you, <clears throat> you see the bags you get at Home Depot, you put your yard waste in them, and you'll throw them down at the windmill or the, wherever they recycle in the paper bags. They're compostable. Yeah, so they get all ground up and they actually probably uh, can mm -hmm. hold moisture, which could be a good thing. The big difference has to do with more of a town getting rid of materials. Oh. So it's, you know, the tonnage is greater when you use paper because it's heavier. It's on that scale rather than a consumer scale. Um, so it's your cardboard recycling or whatever, but it's hard yeah, I know to the, know how much of that we have going out. And the end game is use those canvas bags as you know, once people get used to that, then that's, mm -hmm. that's a great thing. You know, I mean, right. Just one more. When you uh, spoke with the establishments, are they okay with the six months of a, to have that lead time once the bylaw goes into effect? <coughs> they've got six months to get their establishment up and running, all plastic bags out. Was that adequate time for them? It seemed like it. Um, we just verbally, um, you know, asked them, and then we they have looked into some of the other towns that have um, done it. Yes, and six it months. hasn't been yet. Yeah, they've all been six months, okay. and there have been a few. If you, they can't ask for an extension. If they need okay. It. One thing you might think about is, um, at least again, in touch with the Chamber of Commerce and even the merchants, carbon merchants, um, you know, situate merchants, just so that they are aware <coughs> that this is going on the ballot or going on the uh, warrant. So the reason is, is that they might contact you and we'll give you further feedback. I'd rather hear it now than hear it on town floor. That's all. And we're hoping for that to be a productive okay. partnership in terms of. Of making you know awareness and maybe some kind of yeah. great awareness. Just, all right. That being said, motion. The motion. Why don't you just keep your name, please? Address. Thank you. And John, I have two questions. One would be if the bylaw was into effect, and you have your own plastic bags, and you bring those to the supermarket. Is that a violation of the bylaw? No. Right. So some people like me have 10 years supply of plastic bags <laughs> at home. But my other question would be, I mean, it's really uh, consideration to including in this discussion uh, the banning of plastic six-pack holders, which is one of the biggest uh, killers of marine life on the planet, and whether that's any part of any of this discussion. Have you folks considered we that? We have, but we have a whole list, and we have straws. Yeah, straws. We could, we could, <laughs> so we could sit the, out so probably the time. Time. like to. <laughs> I'm sure with you, we'd love to. Um, but right now, we wanted to. That would be a good, a good one for the future. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So, the short the answer is no. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Entertain a motion? I'll make a motion that the board add the plastic bag ban to the fall special town meeting warrant. Second. Motion by Ms. Kern. Seconded by Ms. Canfield. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. And then I guess Lisa will see you back in two weeks. Okay. Ladies, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to the 820 discussion vote, Citrus Town Library, 88 Walkway. See Noel out there and Joe. Gentlemen. <coughs> Joe, are you going to talk to us about the walkway here? Sure. Um, I would say a little over two months ago, we were uh, exploring the different options to allow us to find a handicap accessibility from Grant Street up to the library. Um, Odenello's had done an exceptional job to come up with a couple of variations. Um, they provided documentation and a set of plans for to, to me to allow me to solicit some costs associated with providing that walkthrough from Grant Street up. I solicited three local companies and one outside of Situate, which every contractor this time of year is very busy. So um, I was able to get, get a, a number uh, provide that walkway. Um, we elected to hold off until the summer was over to allow residents to use the library and we'll do it in the off season. It just made the most sense. 
Um, we're here now in front of you to be uh, asked to, to move forward with that direction on the installation of the walkway, um, provided the cost um, of that and utilizing a little bit of the bid savings that we had turned back from the library project. We'd utilize it to stay within our procurement for the project and still be able to um, turn back the, the remainder of the money. What's the present rate right now on the uh, walkway up here? Is it 17% or? or uh, no, that's the actual elevation change from okay. Branch Street to the entrance. Uh, okay. It varies, but it, it varies from, it, it essentially it needs to be less than 5%, 5 and yeah. the majority of it is over 5% yeah. slope. So then the proposal is to put a switch back in to connect the from, from obviously from the base of Branch Street. Um, and then it basically heads towards the situ library sign and then goes around a tree and then meets up with the little walk on the whole level. And then once you're able to get there, you have access by vis-a-vis -vis the lower level? And then, okay. That's right. That's right. Right. So it doesn't take you all the way up to the main entrance. Um, we've reviewed three options with the Architectural Access Board, the State Board. Um, and they um, accepted the option providing access to the lower level entrance. This is actually um, for the library. So, uh, Jesse, then this door is going to be open. Is it open all the time? Because that's it's, going to be their access. It's not. Um, so it's going we to don't have the staff to be able to monitor that, that area. Where we have a camera already on that lower level. Um, so we've discussed tapping into that camera feed, which can be done, um, and being able to buzz people in. Um, so that's that's what we've been discussing. Is that acceptable? Is that really acceptable once we get all that done? Yeah, and that's what we had um, reviewed with the access board. That was a proposal submitted. So yeah, the doorbell, see the access board be a saying, to the front I can see the access board saying because it's an entryway that they'll allow that in. I just want to make sure, maybe it's a discussion that we have to have because um, I want to make sure that it's, it's, it's uh, how do I put this, each access is, is the same. There's no disparity between one entry to the other. And um, so, Jesse, that might be a discussion we have to figure out further because the door's got to be accessible open for people. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that's what the plan is then to but the switch back that went back and forth to link with this lower section so that people can come in with a wheelchair if they're coming in from Grand Street. Right. $25,000 is what you need to be able to right. do it. Yeah. Question? To build, a, to build a, a winding sidewalk to here. Yeah. How, many, how long is it? Uh, it's about 175 feet. So the project in total is um, the existing sidewalk on the opposite side of Branch Street, we need to tab out um, to the to the actual street paving, paint a crosswalk, and then do a landing on the library side of the street, um, and then the pathway to this entrance. So that's the full project in total. So some of this part of this project is to do work that's beyond the property, the library's property, that there's really the reinstate the striping that was there before the roadway project had happened. So this this request for the money encompasses that full scope of work. Yeah. That's a good thing. Can't we do the striping ourselves? Um, do we have to make uh, sidewalk cuts? Do we have to make sidewalk cuts? There's a minor improvement that you have to make on the far side of Branch Street to tie into the, mean the, the asphalt walkway that's there. There's a there's a Cape Cod berm that has to be cut through to make that connection. An asphalt berm, not concrete. Right. Uh, just for those people who might be watching tonight for the first time, how did this happen? I find one across the street, but the grade of this building didn't change. Right. So um, how did this get missed? I, I wanted to explain that because it, yeah, um, Conrad Ello with Odenzello Architecture. Um, first of all, we take ADA accessibility really um, seriously. It's an important part of the work that we do, and this building is fully accessible. Um, certainly, we provided the handicapped parking spaces at the top entrance. We introduced some new handicapped parking spaces at the lower entrance, which didn't exist. 
beforehand, we improve the walkway that comes across from the elderly housing and the, and the bus stop, I guess that's Central Park yeah. Drive. Um, and the reason the walkway that was reinstalled is essentially the existing walkway that was there. We made some of the steepest parts of that slope a little less steep. Um, the reason that was not meeting the accessible route requirements is because the existing topography is so steep, it's steeper than 5%. And there's an exception in the accessibility code in the, in the Mass General uh, rules that we thought was applicable here. It was, in a, it was a, a public walk along a public way, you know, accessing the, the parking lot that we felt fell within this exception. The access board didn't agree, and that's where this has come up. And so now we're required to address that difference of opinion, but it was our co-consultants, our design team, that was our professional opinion that we fell within a certain requirement. Bob Vogel certainly was involved in those discussions, and I don't want to speak for him, but he was supportive of that position as well. Um, he's supportive of this improvement that we're making to the project, but that was that was why it wasn't as if we just you know neglig negligently didn't address accessibility. We felt we felt we had a case here. Or this was a steep existing condition. New so switchbacks. We worked a little bit on some of our own projects. So, do you have restroom spots within the designated incline or in decline? I want to clarify there are no, no switchbacks or handrails. The, the entire right. There's none that are required. Though. Right. The entire walkway is less than 5% great. Um, and it's of the required width, and it's of a length that you don't actually need. With longer rents, you will need a wider section for crossing. As if it exceeds 200 feet in length, this does not exceed 200 feet in length. So it's not technically a ramp by definition. It's, it's a sloped walkway. So it'll look like just normal sidewalk, and it's just it's staying all under 5%. I just, I don't know. Prove me wrong once, and that's fine. <laughs> Prove me wrong twice. I want to. All right? But on Elm Street, we, you know, and I don't know anything about it, but we had to have a resting spot for the folks to cross Elm Street. And that's, we have an island in the middle, and that is 30, 40 feet long. So, you're way up. I just, I just, just, guys, just do it right. That's all I'm asking. Or tell them. Making every effort to do it right. <laughs> Certainly don't want to. I don't like your things twice. Well, I know I know that they could do switchbacks. But I think five percent or less. It's not. It's going to be one continuous ramp, right? You know, so it's right. Off. And it's I don't know if you have the the drawing as, a, as an mm -hmm. exhibit. We don't. Um, I'm happy to, to share a few copies just to sure. clarify. Well, he's bringing those up here. What was the exception you were looking for? So it, there's an exception in the code. It's it's uh, it's uh, the code of Massachusetts reg uh, regulations 22.3, which deals with walkways, accessible walkways, or walkway grading. And basically, the exception says that sidewalks on streets and ways with a natural slope that exceeds five percent need not be, by definition, a ramp. Um, this slope, you know, the 17 feet that we had to navigate between an existing entrance, an existing building, and Branch Street, by, you know, just by natural topography was greater than 5%, so we felt we were in that exception. But how, how, how do we expect handicapped people to get to the entrance? So the, the design and the, even with the, the review with the town was that the architect made the provisions that the accessibility would get to the parking lot. So any one of these parking lots and parking spaces was accessible. To yeah, so we were providing accessibility from the, from the handicapped spots, number one. We had also a, a completely accessible route from outside the property by way of Central Park Drive. And that's also where the public bus stop is. So that was that was provided as part of the base. If the so we already had is, it, we had accessibility. We just didn't have it from yeah, every street. If the if the walkway that currently is in place was never in place, this wouldn't have been an issue unless it was brought. In other words, if you didn't offer a walkway from Branch Street, so if it wasn't a sidewalk, we wouldn't have to do yeah, it. Yeah, we probably wouldn't have done it. But still, how was someone gonna, how would someone walk to the library and get in? 
they would they would basically try it up to it or have access to it through another other mm -hmm. Or you come from Central Park. Right. Right. Come from another another road. But either way this was a so, you, so we actually thought about this and decided that that was not necessary. Yes, during the design process. Yeah. And this was, well, not, I mean, this is, you know, we're responsible for providing, for providing a project that works. Um, but this was, many, many eyes were on this. This went through a pretty exhaustive planning board review process. And again, Bob, you know, Bob reviewed all the drawings as well. And, um, I think was supportive of that exception. But there was a group of people that looked at it and said, we don't have to have a handicap access from walking on Branch Street to the front entrance of the library. Because of the position the architect and the team had taken. Well, because of this existing, it was right. an existing it's building, an existing place. grade, an existing condition. But it's not to say we weren't providing accessibility no, no, I to the we library. We've got access over here. We've got access. There are multiple ways yeah, they, to get They thought the accessibility was there based on the design that was in front of and that was people from the town right. outside of you guys said yes that's fine so the one board that should have probably had a review on this would have been the commission on disabilities um, i think i don't think they have an eye on this and i think internally that's something that we the town need to ensure that they have a chance to review um, because i'd be willing to bet they would have probably picked up on it yeah. Um, yeah, normally with a planning board review process, you know, all the departments, DPW, um, CONCOM, whatever it is, whatever departments need to weigh in. Conrad, yeah, I agree with you, but yeah. I, I think one of the things that I've found um, that uh, accessibility has been something that has, has been marginalized, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but until you get injured, until you have somebody who needs, crutches needs or the care. ability mm -hmm. to get around you, begin to realize that there are a lot of barriers. and. Um, I think you know, certainly we have a proposal of RFP going out to, to review town structures, um, which I think every town should do. We need to do because there's so many places that are inaccessible. And I just I think you know the boards they, they work hard, and I'm not trying to uh, denigrate them, but again, I think that's sometimes over over uh, over missed. You know, that there's an oversight there, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that we need to do better. Because to be honest with you. Um, it got missed. I realized you took a position on it, um, but I, in retrospect, I'm like, we should have made sure it was done. Anyways. Yeah. Well, I think that's what, why we're making sure it gets done now. Yeah, yeah. and my point was, we didn't miss it. We chose not to do it. Right. Right. Um, may I? Yeah. Good. Uh, well, I think you raised a good point that I sort of want to address now because we tend to always come back to things. <laughs> So right now we've got the plans that we're just going to slap a slot sign on the outside door with the number for folks to call when they're standing there or sitting there. I find that unacceptable. I think the doorbell's got to be put in at the same time or whatever so folks can really have access into the lower level. I, I think having someone out there in the rain, the snow, and having to make a phone call, having someone have to be on the other end of that phone call to be allowed into the building isn't really where we want to be okay. at. So I don't know how we put in a, a doorbell or whatever that system is with this fix so you don't have to come back again. Um, it's something that I would prefer to see done. Well, that's a question, Jim, maybe. I know you were trying to think you're out when you're talking about this. I asked Jesse, is that the intent right now is to have somebody come up if they're in a wheelchair, the door's locked. And I'm like, I don't think that, personally, can't be. And they don't have to say off, supposedly, but I'm like, I think it's a discussion that you need to have because I'm like, the door's got to be open for something. There. And whether it's a camera, maybe it's something, I don't know. The, the difference on that door is hardware setup. You'd have to do either like a, a mag lock with controls from the, from the circulation desk. So when they got buzzed, they'd be able to hit a button and that lock would release at that point. I mean, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing at the schools. Yeah, can we include that? We, yeah, I can explore that, yeah. Okay. yeah. I might be a little bit somewhere. Let us know. I want to make sure it's done right for people. So when I'm in a wheelchair, I'm going to be able to not sit out there if it's raining or snowing or something. So I've done that just recently on the door, and it's about four to five thousand dollars to do the magline uh, that way with a mother. 
just so you know, what, what we presented to the Access Board was three options. We did present a, a, another option, which, which included switchback ramps and handrails, getting you all the way to the front door. And that's something you could choose to do. It's, it's more money, and it's going to be more invasive. Where would uh, that be, kind of right up here? Or that would be basically, um, I, we did it, I mean, that's, I think from roughly the lower entrance of the building up, you introduced a series of switchback ramps into that hillside where the sort of All planted, planted right terrace is now. Uh, it would be significantly more than the, than, the, than the slope walkway to the lower entrance. And it wasn't required of the access board that you implement that, but that's another option. And I don't think it's a question of money, but if a person's in a wheelchair, they might be out with the weather. Water are doing that. I, there's yeah. that yeah. That's absolutely right. And there's also the issue of just how many, what, how many people I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I, I agree that you know even if one person is coming along that walkway, you want to treat them equitably and, and fairly. But I, there just is probably so, so little demand that people would be coming by wheelchair along that walkway anyway. Um, not to mention that it's a longer route from the street to get up to the up that further climb. So I'll just walk. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Joe, you just said that uh, we approve this, then it would be fall, we would start the Yeah, it would be shortly after later. Okay. Contractors already looked at it and priced it. The design is complete and ready to go. How long do you think it'll take construction last? Uh, it'll work probably a week, week to 10 days. I just think once once we get that straight down and have the crosswalk, then and school's in session, there'll be a lot more bikes, um, which would be a good thing. Just one last <coughs> so just the math, so that's about one hundred and fifty dollars a foot for the sidewalk for the path. Is that in the norm? Yeah, I mean it's, it's not, a, but it's just cement, right? Yeah, but it's prevailing wage. Yeah, well, there's some other. Are you talking about the twenty-five thousand dollar figure? Yeah. It's so I think the the actual concrete work was sixteen grand of that twenty-five thousand. And so it's <coughs> less than that to pour the concrete, but there's some warning strips, striping, <coughs> there would be the, the signage on the, on the glass at the door. So all those things are wrapped into that $25,000 number. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to just say it's yeah, an accessibility 150 bucks on the near foot of sidewalks. It just, it just sounds expensive. I, I am out of here. Sean, I don't know. You have more, probably more knowledge than me on that. It just sounds expensive for there's a tree removal too. There's a tree removal. There's a couple of other things in there that are sort of related to the to the project. Concrete's like other dolls, square foot, cubic foot, but that's privately so. Right. <coughs> okay. It may, it may come in less than that. I mean, obviously, we'll use. We've been very tight with what minimum sorry, it is. But that was we wanted to not have to come back and ask for more. I think the bid for the concrete work was 16, so. but that what we had extras with the removal of the tree that the uh, handicap accessible uh, ramps that would be coming off of the streets on each side, striping, um, dis disposable material. I mean, it was there was a number of things with that. Okay. Mike, Mike Hayes, 35 Allen Place. First, I want to commend the board for for. Uh, looking into this issue and, and proposing a change. I can tell you from my perspective and some personal experience from when there are a couple of meetings saying this room. Uh, and I've been to many and I've been to some that have gone beyond the library hours. Uh, the only way currently, unless you want the police meeting you in your driveway if you walk out the front door, uh, which happened to me once, but um, <laughs> is to have public access outside here for people with mobility issues and frankly parking because the evening that I chose to go up the elevator and go out the front door was because my car was on the upper level. If it was on the if there was parking on the lower level and a uh, public entrance or uh, some mechanism to keep you know um, bring people in or whatever it may be. Uh, it makes a huge difference rather than walking up that steep hill. So, did I hear correctly that there would be a part of the proposal is for some handicap parking in the lower level? There is handicap parking here at the lower level already. Um, <coughs> I must have missed 
Okay. Yeah, there's two spots and a crosswalk and an accessible walk to get to the lower end. Is it right there? It's right there, sorry. <clears throat> right out there. That, that already exists. But uh, I must have missed that. Well, I agree. And that's why I'm like, having been here with late meetings in the prior building, um, that was the exit because the library gets shut down. And so like, I can see how that's, it will be used publicly. So, right. Um, and we'll figure out the logistics. But, but just when we have a system in place, that will work. Okay. Any other questions? Motion? I think that the board is likely to release $25,000 in contingency account for an ADA walkway improvements at the Citroën Town Library. Motion by Ms. Kerman, seconded by second. Mr. Harris, all those in favor? Aye. 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 John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I also want to commend you. <coughs> Obviously, the sound is yes. not existing anymore. So we were out and getting that resolved. We were relieved. There's some little loose ends we're still tying up. Good job. Certainly feels, yeah, it's working. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to the uh, 8.30 discussion. We're going to be backed up here for White House Farm Open Space uh, donation. Attorney Michael Hayden is here on behalf of the developer. And I think this is a final... Um, We, we need to vote. Is it Mike on the uh, yes, the, the deed that the town is accepting it? Is that it? There was the deed, a yes, the deed to the uh, open space about uh, almost nine acres that the conservation is requirement of the open flexible open space uh, subdivisions and uh, the conservation commission has accepted this land because it abuts public water supply. Uh, so. Uh, I have the deed here that I think is in your package um, that has been signed by the Sharon, the owner, and his daughter, the co-owner. So I have the deed here for you, if you wrote it, to uh, sign it and give it back to me if you want, and I can get it recorded or whatever your pleasure is. Any questions from the board? No, it's straight up past case. Yeah, it's, it, it's yeah. taken some time. How many acres is it? Six? Well, there's uh, a total of almost nine. There's six, six acres um, and 2.2. Two, two. Some of this is um, um, upland and some is, is wetlands. But total of almost nine. Right. All right, motion. Move that the board of selectmen accept open space to be reserved by the donation. For conservation purposes, as outlined in the lot layout plan, <coughs> quote, in White Ash Farm Lane, quote, prepared by Morse Engineering on February 19, 2013. Motion by Mrs. Okay. Canfield, seconded by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mike, we can, if you can leave that with Michelle, we'll sign it at the okay. end, and then Michelle can that be available tomorrow morning. Um, you know what? I think we have it, but I'll. Great. And just so you know, the deed was approved by Tom Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. All right. Now we're going to move on to an 840 discussion on the company's new connection. John Drew, and uh, they here? Right. Yeah, and um, oh, is it this on the posted agenda. I think the copies that you have do not reflect this agenda item, but on the website, this is a posted agenda item. Okay. So my apologies for that. Gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Sidgwick. Good to see you both. Thank you for uh, having us on. Having them on tonight allowing me to provide some kind of context as to why we are here tonight. Um, 
So if you remember, I think it was a month or so ago, uh, the company came for you um, to get your blessing to move forward. Uh, coming up, with, if you remember, the two-track kind of options for this potential sewer connection agreement. Um, the two tracks would be, one would be, and I'll get into both in more detail in just a second. Um, the, one would be the kind of grant option uh, where we were pursuing funding from the Mass Work State Grant Program. Um, and the other is the non-grant option. So in the meantime, in the last, again, since the last time they met, uh, came before you, um, we've been working with them closely, both myself, uh, DPW, town administrator, involved met with them to discuss kind of the details of these two options. Um, and just again, just, just for a reminder, the key points of this proposal of the project um, and why, you know, in particular, I think this uh, proposal has garnered a lot of support, um, that it's consistent with the town's established vision for Greenbush and the master plan. Um, this is a pedestrian and transit-oriented development located in the vacant parking lot adjacent to the uh, Greenbush Green Rail Station. Um, it provides much needed affordable housing, minimizes environmental and traffic impact since it's redeveloping an underutilized parking lot within an area that already has a uh, traffic signal. Um, significant support in town, uh, the various boards, uh, EDC, planning board, again, that come before you in the past, um, and other um, kind of town support, if you will. Um, you know, there have been previous proposals for the site, but none have met as many local planning objectives nor state objectives as the proposal before um, the town right now. Um, but as we discussed at the last meeting, I don't think it's support for the project or this project being the right fit. That's the issue. I think it's sewer capacity. Um, so that's why, again, they've been doing their due diligence and working with us to try and come up with some solutions. Um, so to go into those two, two details in a little bit more, um, or two options in a little bit more detail, um, the first is the grant option. Um, so uh, the, just last week, August 13th, um, we submitted a, a grant to the MassWorks Infrastructure Grant Program. Um, in that application, the town is requesting $2.2 million to make sewer infrastructure capacity improvements that would allow the town to use previously authorized town funds uh, for other sewer capacity related improvements. So basically freeing up funding that the town has already voted to approve to make necessary improvements, and free that funding up to do something else, and this would entirely um, pay for um, a recent sewer project at Cedar Point, um, again, which I received uh, approval at town meeting. Um, Brad, can you explain that? So the, the grant is to release money that we already have approved? Yeah, so the town authorized at the previous town meeting two point, and an amount up to $2.2 million to pay for these sewer improvements at Cedar Point. Um, we are leveraging the Drew Company development because it meets so many objectives of that grant program via economic development, housing, affordable housing, et cetera. So they want to see developments like these in these locations, and they're willing to make investments in communities in their infrastructure. So, and another advantage for a program like this is to have a project that's shown already. So Cedar Point has been approved, has the funding in place, it's been out for design, engineering, and it's ready to go out to bid. So that's about as shovel ready as you can get. So what we applied for was funding to cover that project and then we could use you know, that authorization to do whatever you folks in the town wishes to do to make other improvements on top of this project. So the grant is to pay for the project that we already have approved. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it would alleviate that burden on the taxpayer and those funds could be used for something else. Right. And then we would have to get another project to to go before the town before something for something else. Yes. Yes. Um, so so that you know the Cedar Point project um, creates or eliminates approximately forty thousand gallons a day of inflow and infiltration. Um, in addition to again, we need projects like this to leverage to the state to get the grant. They don't provide these grants without kind of them getting something out of this as well. But in addition to you know, their assistance, hopefully getting this grant for the town, um, we, again, we've been in negotiating discussions with them um, to get approximately $400,000 uh, to contribute to, let's say, more traditional I, &I work that we're already doing in town. So manhole rehabilitation and lateral service, either repair or re uh, uh, replacement. So again, that additional that they're providing is actually carving out their capacity. 
So not only are we doing this grant project that is um, basically removing 40,000 gallons of II uh, from the system per day, they are doing additional improvements that carve out the capacity that they need on top of that. John, can I just ask, yeah. well, how are you guaranteeing 40,000 gallons saved? That's the, the Cedar Point project. What, just give me a quick, how is, what's that gonna do? So what? that's the, uh, the uh, force main removal of the existing uh, clay gravity lines in the Cedar Point neighborhood. So we think that by replacing those lines, we're gonna have 40,000 40, gallons a day less leakage? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the CDM, the uh, II report that we have from 2017 documents based upon the various uh, sewer needs areas or contribution areas, what the contribution of II is from each of those areas. And the, the, uh, the Cedar Point area has 40,000 gallons per day, so if you kind of remediate that area, you'll, you'll have those savings uh, in terms of gallons per day. Totally. Um, I had, we had that discussion with Kevin, and Kevin put flow meters out there, and if I'm going to speak and let me know, the flow meters out from a point in the middle of the night where there was very little activity, if not any, if any. and that's what the time said is a hard number. That's, okay. they can, Good. And to, I think that's to your point. Yeah, yeah so there's, there's the high tide that we're just sucking in every day, and then this, that report also goes through kind of event contributions, so that's your range, your flooding, your... Great. Yep. Uh, so again, the, and then the additional work above and beyond, so I, I didn't say it at the beginning, but their projected development of 78 housing units in the commercial space is projected to um, contribute about 15,000 gallons per day to the system. So considering this grant option, again, we'd be seeking funding for that 40,000 gallon per day project, but they'd also be contributing funding to take out an additional 18,000 gallons per day. So their contribution, 15,000 gallons per day, plus a factor of 20%. Karen has a question. Yes. Well, you just answered half the question. The other question, remind me what we think the capacity for the full build out at Seaside is. Their contribution? Yeah. For, uh, probably 40,000. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was half. I thought it was 20. To, to the Drew project? I thought it was no, 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 no. This is 15, I just want to know what the was. Oh, okay. Yeah, 12, I think, it was 152 units, so I think it was closer to uh, 40,000, a little under 40,000, I think, today. Um, so, again, this is, I think, if we could get the grant, if we could, you know, do this additional II on top of it, I think we're taking out. You know, almost three or four times what this project would be contributing. So, um, you know, clearly see that as kind of a win-win for folks. The second track, if we are Can not. Ask one question on the first track. Yes. Is it your um, opinion that we wouldn't be able to get this grant without that project? Definitely not. We have to. Live. They have certain kind of program uh, objectives that they're trying to do with the Mass Works grant, and they, through that program, they are trying to again encourage economic development, job creation, okay. housing. So to get that, they facilitate improvements. So they, the projects are, we're yes. saying, yep. we're doing this. Okay. Yep. Great. And what is the uh, timeline on the grant, the notification? When do you think uh, they would rule on that? Uh, they're fast. So we submitted in August, and I'd expect we'd know in October. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this? So then moving on to the non-grant option. Again, this is kind of plan B. So if we are unable to secure the Mass Works grant, uh, Drew Company would still commit to do the I, &I uh, the, I guess the traditional I, &I for, so taking out the 18,000 gallons per day out of the system through manhole rehabilitation and the lateral improvements. Um, under this scenario, we understand that we obviously see that they'd have to do more, so we're continuing to work with them on an appropriate amount of funding to go above and beyond that to do, again, additional I, &I work or other things that the, the DPW can direct us to that would be helpful and add capacity to the system. So that's, that's kind of my quick update. I don't know if you folks want to ask if you have any questions about that particular option. Questions or not? No, this just did a tremendous amount of work to get that application done. I just want to you know, commend Brad and the team for doing um, to getting it in and getting it on boxes too. It's, it is a pile of work to try to apply for the current. I mean, my only comment that I sort of put down here today is you know, we put millions and millions into I&I, &I and we haven't really been guaranteed any improvement. Um, that's why I love the fact that the Cedar Point had somewhat guaranteed improvement. But I don't, I don't know that replacing manhole covers and this other stuff that we're thinking about are actually going to actually turn into anything. 
So I'm wondering if, they, if the grant doesn't come through, if somehow we get money, whatever money we get, we put towards that project anyway, where, where it's guaranteed a return. Um, we could do that, or we could put it towards, there's actually, there's future phases of Cedar Point type projects, so yeah. the future force main expansions that are needed in those other high needs areas like Oceanside. Um, you could certainly, you know, invest in that next phase. Um, you could, so again, looking at that report, there's Cedar Point and then Oceanside's broken up into a few phases, so you could, you know, fast track one of the other phases if that made more sense. Um, to get the estimates for the expected uh, II removal for the manhole covers and the laterals, you know, they, they refer to DEP and EPA guidance for expected kind of um, gallons per day you take out when you make these improvements. And I believe they, they actually cut that expected amount down by a certain percentage just to kind of be more realistic. Because I think the numbers you get from EPA and EP are probably conservative, but just to be even more conservative, I think we're taking a little off of that. This is one of the things on the, uh, on the laterals. As Brad said earlier, we know what type of buy and I would get from those pipes. The Drew Company sent a camera into the main pipe, and there's really very little wear and tear or damage in the main pipe. So that tells us the the leakage is coming from the laterals, either where they're connected to the pipe or somewhere going into the house. So we're pretty confident that that will have an I and I reduction. And the manhole covers, that will help. It's just it's storm related. So if we have a lot of storms, it's keeping a lot of a lot of storms, it's not keeping quite as much out. And we accounted for that when we did the uh, the map. Yeah, and where are where are the laterals in the same area? Yeah. Good point. Do you represent you guys did that? So your, your company had a company come yeah. to that? And I forgot to mention that. So they went out because they were actually, you know, basically looking for projects that they could do to, to eliminate II. So they went out and came with the lines like Jim mentioned. And a lot of the previous improvements that the town has done are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But there's other kind of pieces in that puzzle that have not been replaced or updated. So a lot of the leakage, you know, kind of, you know, is still on the surface. Coming out of those areas that have not been updated. You would put a line in the pipe. The line in the pipe is intact, and we're still getting 99, which is telling us it's coming from the laterals someplace else. No, it's just, I think it's interesting to Tony's point, it's, you know, having a different set of eyes, we've always had the same names, and, you know, same firms out there year after year. And to Tony's point, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere if the two company used a different. Engineering, you know, maybe it's time we looked around if you guys, if you, especially if you saw something different than what we thought. But if, if we're on the same page, then that, that's good to know. I'm just going to make a comment that, or I guess it will be a question uh, to, to everyone. Is it a 50 50 chance that you get the grant? Or, from my opinion, I think we take off every box um, when you know with the work that Brad did because there are pieces of it that are transoriented development you know you get points for that as well this, this hits that I and mean, the residential piece I, I don't think there was anything missing we've kind of that looked into that to make sure that, that that's correct um, so I, I you know I feel like we have a very good shot but and I think it was a pretty clear state <clears throat> the META who's trying to get rid of this parcel trying to surplus the parcel that this is developer and the development that the town is most pleased with. And if this doesn't go through, they aren't going to be able to sell the property or move on something for a long time because it took us a long time to get to here. Um, if you scrap or, or kind of help out the development that's, you know, again, most liked, I think it um, appears like this. Uh, the only thing I would add, I'll tip of the hat to you, when we would, in front of you, we would talk about the, the, the issues we had to deal with on sewerage. And we mentioned the fact that the option had the Push back the MBTA, you were kind enough to have uh, approved Jim writing a letter of support. Uh, that letter of support actually matters to the state because it shows the fact that the town is supporting the project and therefore the project is, is, is important to the town. Most uh, projects don't have that kind of support. So, I mean, you've helped. You helped us with that one issue, but also that same letter basically helps. There's a part of the yeah. That checks off the shovel ready box because they know the town is not going to throw up regulatory roadblocks to the land department. I was just going to kind of ask along that same thought. I think last time you were with us, you had a PNS that was due at a certain date. Right. You to let so they were, are they continuing to work with you? They continue to work with us, but we really do have to close by December. Yeah. So, the, right. and we have the, the, uh, the, the planning uh, board was very supportive, but we were, I think, 
correctly sent to talk to you about the sewer issue to see if we could have a resolution on sewer issue before we go back and go to the play. So I mean, it's uh, if we could uh, agree to option B in the event that, uh, that the grant doesn't come through with you and get your approval on that, we'll go right to the planning board side of the process. And hopefully we'll have a grant nice that time. Okay. How's the board feel? I think the two tracks are entirely appropriate for where you are, and my you know, ideas for that. I would expect that option to be nailed out, nailed out, and so they can run on. We did a very good meeting with them. It was last week. It was last week. It was last week. You know, option A is all set. We just need to nail that option B, and I think we're going to get that done fairly soon. So the board will have both options in front of you. You can approve them. Sit before you and then they can go forward and move forward the project. I guess there's nothing else they need for option A. The ball's in their corner. The grant is yeah, sponsored. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like you've heard the board supportive of either option. So you're not looking for a vote tonight. It's just a discussion. Yeah. So yeah. that just gives you enough to be able to proceed forward and uh, get to the planning board and get through the uh, site plan, I guess, uh, or permit, permitting, I guess. Yeah, uh, site plan review. So it is an as of right zoning project, so that's what so they don't permit, they just need yeah. a site plan. But I think that's it, gentlemen, for us, right? Would we uh, or they um, be able to come to a future meeting soon if the details of plan B are, are kind of flashed out? As soon as we have it nailed down, we'll go back to the board. Absolutely. Put it on the very next agenda that you need so you're not confined, constrained with the uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Going to move on now to a discussion vote on the grant of Plummer on Easement. And next to discussion item 850. Jim. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I've been faced with is the meeting before the Hummer on Easement project uh, and the grant of the easement. There were some questions about adding some stuff into the actual easement, about maintenance requirements. When do we actually record this on the deed? So uh, I worked with Mar and we came up with a new easement. We set up the town council. The town council was not in favor of putting those things in the easement. Uh, I sort of believe that the easement stood as it was, but the, the requirements for maintenance and the pledge that we would not record the easements until the town was ready to go forward with the project would be in the cover letter that we would send. That would be a binding agreement that the town would not do these things. So what you have in front of you is an easement that's almost identical to what we used on the seawalls, but a cover letter that would go with it that would set out what the town's requirements would be for maintenance, which would be with what we have in the grant application. And Brad said we're going to go over that. And that we would not record these deeds until the town had funding and was ready to go forward with the project. That makes sense. It again, wouldn't record it until the town said that you should yeah. do it. Otherwise, it's, it's useless. Yeah. So what we're asking for the board is to approve the letter and the easement. Again, the easement, for all intents and purposes, is, is almost identical to what we used on the city walls. Yeah, I, I have no problem with it. I've reviewed the easement, and my feeling is what we we expected from other residents in town, in particular the <coughs> sea walls. Um, that's what they've ended up signing, um, and I don't see a difference here, even though it's not sea walls we're dealing with, we're dealing with each nourishment. And we have a project in mind that is mostly public, so potentially like part of it would be private. <clears throat> and if we're going to do that portion, they would have to sign these proposals. Yeah. yeah. Questions from the board? Tom? Um, I'm just looking at this now. So what is the what is the nourishment project? What what area is it covered? Uh, Brad probably wrote a little bit better than I could, but it's basically the base of Fourth Cliff, heading back towards Hamar proper. Down to Barrett Street. So is this for the Air Force area? No, no. no really down. This, this is, is where the actual home is. This is for Central Ave, and it's in two phases. And um, It's actually at the base of Fourth Cliff. Jump. You know, where the road forks and yep. head up to the base, and it starts there, okay. where it's yeah. pretty rough. And that's where we've always been nervous about it. Right. It comes back to us. And it comes back to us. And we'll have the sand there. Yes. <laughs> It's almost a cobble. Um, it's not like we think of beach sand, it's more of a cobble, so it would stay there better. Um, 
Isn't John Ramsey coming before the John, board in September? Yeah. Yeah. To go over the entire plan with you. And we want the people to make their property accessible to town. The part that we're going to be putting this new beach on, yes. Correct. So this was updated just for some history. Um, the Coastal Resource Officer, Nancy, did a presentation to the Hummer Rock residents on June 25th. And there were still some concerns that surrounded around um, maintenance and also not filing the easement until the project starts. So that's why we went back to our town council who amended what you have before you tonight and also advised us for the cover letter to address the I could see why. I could see why they're concerned. Like, uh, it's a town that have filed the easement without the project going forward. And I, I'd be upset if that were the case, but it's not. As far as the area of easement, that's the area where the work's going to be performed. Well, there's two easements. There's a temporary construction easement and an easement where this actually will be. Um, in with the seawall, I'm going to assume this is the same. Each house has a different easement <coughs> plan. So now we're going to attach the people in the courts. We'll show that the temporary easement for construction and the permanent easement that will allow people to, to use that portion of the same thing we do with seawalls. Right. Now, there's no, there's no access from Central Ave over someone's property to that front right. beach. Right. It's just going to be the actual beach portion itself. It's the same thing with seawalls. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, just one more. Um, yeah. So, the responsibility for this now is following the Brad because I'm, I just want to know where the Coastal Re uh, Officer's job search is coming. So it's, been we, it's been advertised, and then we have an interview on Friday. We've had three people apply and started the schedule on news, so we're fine. So right now we'll be on Friday. Another water thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Or anything? I don't have any. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Rich Feely, 286 Central Ave. What is the legal standing of a cover letter? And by that I mean is five years from now, three years from now, somebody goes and records the easement, regardless of the project schedule, and then it's recorded. It's done. What, what does that cover letter do for me? If I had to go back and sue the town and say, you agreed that you weren't going to do this, but you did it. It's now on my deed. I'm into a big fight for my property. That doesn't cut for me. It's not going to cut for me. Well, Mr. Feely, I, I, I feel for you, but, you know, there comes a point when you are a citizen and you're working with your town, and the town can look to, together, collectively, decides that they're going to be paying out of their taxes to help you and your residents, okay. because you're living in a very dangerous area, mm -hmm. with the water and the seas and the storms. Um, you got to have trust. And if you don't have trust from the get-go in any relationship, whether it's with the town or friends or family, yep. then that relationship is doomed from the start. And if your position is that, geez, the town is going to go on its own with your property, or your neighbor's property, or all the people's property, and try to snook around and saying, we just took your beach. We did it under, shall we say, to induce you so that we could steal your beach rights. And that's what you're kind of saying here, and yet we're sending people down there and on, on whatever the storms are, our DPW, our police, fire, to help people who are there during these storms, putting them in harm's way. And our whole push here is to try to make it safer by not putting necessarily a wall in, but extending the beach so that that velocity of those waves are in, absorbed to protect you and your neighbors. You know, it, it really comes down to trust, and if you don't trust the town, because you got a, a letter saying they're not going to record it and you think they're going to do it, we're doomed. And I'll be candid with you, then my feeling on it is if you or other people don't, don't want to sign the easement, you don't have to. We know it's that. Been, it's been demonstrated elsewhere in town where people didn't want to do it on Oceanside. And then we found they don't have a, a seawall. They have an old seawall. It's their seawall. It's not the town owned seawall. So I, I guess what I'd say to you is, yeah, you either trust us because we're trying to work with you and your neighbors to protect you, 
or you don't. And if you don't, then there's not much I can tell you. It really, that's what it boils down to. I agree, and unfortunately, towns, this town's made decisions which have left people feeling less trustworthy. That's the problem, that perspective that you guys have put forward. Well, I'm not sure. Well, I know, I know that's true. Uh, I don't know what you're referring to. Okay. What we have done to make anybody feel, shall we say, that we're distrustful because there's a lot of misinformation out there on certain topics. There's a lot of disinformation out there intentionally put by other people who, frankly, for whatever reason, send it out. I don't know why. But again, I, I implore you, if, if your feeling is the same way, like I think it was 12 people on Oceanside who said, one in particular, is really one person who said, I'm not gonna give an easement, it didn't happen. And that's okay. You know, I will say the town has spent about $100,000 just on this project for the past two years. And at this point, we have $70 million of infrastructure just on foreshore protection and seawall alone that we need to address. And we've chipped away at it for the past five years to the tune of, I think, about $16 million so far. If it doesn't happen, then there are other projects in town that we need to address. So I, I say to you, because you're going to have this meeting with your neighbors, I implore you, you know, if, if there's no trust from you, it doesn't really matter about your neighbors. Because, you know, we need everybody involved. We need the trust factor. It's not just me. That's the point you don't get. Well, I, it's unfortunate, but if that's the way it is, then you know what? <coughs> that's the way it is. Can I make a clarification too? The, the cover letter gets filed with the easement at the registry of deeds, correct? Jim? Yeah, that's the way city. It, it, basically, the cover letter is a contract from the town saying we're going to do right. these things. Whether it's on the cover letter, even if I put it in the easement, there's nothing that says I, if I want to be nefarious and under it, go file a deed. Yeah, I get the money. I file a deed anyway. So, um, you know, there's, there's nothing in it for the town, for lack of a better, better way of putting it. Nothing in it for the town to file the, the easements, right. unless we do the project. Why would we do it? it? It makes no sense because we're filing an easement for something that doesn't exist. The easement is for what we're going to construct. So filing the easement, the easement for nothing unless we construct it. The easement for our land, which you tax us heavily on. The easement is for access to a project that we are going to build. That, but does it's not our current, that does not currently exist. That yeah. is what we are asking for the easement. Fair enough. I understand that. But yeah. it's still our land. Correct. And I'm Whether it's 19 feet high or that I'm zero. making improvements to it. Okay. And in making those improvements, I'll be using state and federal funds. And I will also need state and federal funds to fix it if it gets washed away. To okay. receive those funds, it must be available to the public. So there has to be an easement for the public to use that. I have asked for clarification and that have not received that. Uh, Brad had given you what he thought, what we thought were out of regulations. Uh, I have a further letter from council that I got today that I'll be happy to share with you. It is our belief that the federal government requires it, the state government requires it. I know FEMA will not reimburse on a private property if there's damage, so if there's a storm and it's an emergency declaration, the federal government will not give us money to replace that unless it's open to the public. And finally, as Mr. Danny pointed out, the town of Central will be spending significant sums of money to do that project down there. And the town of Central is requiring that it be open to the public. So, I got the letter late this afternoon, the board just got it, I'll be happy to send it to you tomorrow. Sure. But um, we believe that the requirements are there for the state, the feds, and the town, that there be an easement open to the public before the time to get this project done. Any other questions? She had her hand up first, so I'll get to you in a second. Yes. Lisa Gates, 242 Central Avenue, Um As far as the, uh, the beach nourishment, my understanding was originally it was going to be from the bottom of Fourth Cliff to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 180 Central F. And then it changed to three phases. The first phase is supposed to be now from the bottom of fourth left to 244 Central. My question is, 
when when the easements are submitted, let's say best case scenario, all the easements are signed and submitted, when they're actually uh, taken down to the registry to be filed, is it going to be only for the, the phase that has been funded or for the entire <coughs> project? Only for the phase that's been funded. Okay. Because again, it doesn't make any sense to file an easement for something that doesn't exist. Okay. The, uh, the other question that is asked is, if, if the uh, easement is filed, there's no guaranteed date by which it could be nourished. Will there uh, be a time frame? In other words, let's say, from the point of signing until <coughs> three years from now, if the town can't get funding, would the easements then be returned? Again, we, we won't file it unless we have the funding. So a case in point is Oceanside, all right? It was the, one of the first uh, seawall replacements that we had done asking for easements. We went down, I think it was Kevin Cafferty, went down and talked to all the residents. Will you give us your easement? And after negotiating, talking, and getting language that we have for this easement, people said, yes, I'll do it. Again, they had the same concern you had. Is the project going forward, or am I going to just be giving up a right, which is my, my um, uh, beach rights, uh, to the low tide, whatever whatever the beach rights are set in their deed and everything, because each one can differ. They said, yes, it was on contingent that we get the funding for it. And we, in, in the process, we got, got the funding, and then we went and recorded it, I believe, is how the pro timing went, and then we did the project. Now, the project, I think it took maybe up to two years between getting it out to bid and, and everything else, and it's completed. Then we went to another phase, the phase I just referenced, and it failed. Then we went beyond that phase, further on Oceanside, and did another span. And I believe we've actually done a fourth, or a, which is actually the third one. My point is, is that those residents had some concerns very similar to yours, and we didn't record it, we didn't take their property unless we were able to complete the project. So I, I guess what I'm saying, I, I can understand your concern, like, are we trying to do something here? No, we're not. What we're trying to do is get a project completed to protect that area of Sedgwick. And um, that's why I say to you, if you don't have the trust from the get-go, then I don't see this happening. Um, I just hope that, you know, people understand we're doing this to protect your property. Now, some of you might think, well, gee, now we're looking to create more beaches. Well. If you look at the, uh, I forgot when it was, two years ago when they uh, came, the uh, consultant came and they showed what the beach renourishment was about. It wasn't getting pristine sand, because all that's going to wash out to sea. It's basically trying to find the original uh, material that was here between the cobbles, some sand, some stones, um, and put it back. So, number one, we're not looking to create like a great beach, sandy beach. We're looking to create what was natural there to begin with. Second thing is, even if you're concerned that people now are going to have access to beach property in front of your house, and then have to say to yourself, how do people get there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to have public access. So we have a parking lot down across Marshfield Bridge there. Um, Marshfield Ave, right? The, 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 the bridge is... The town parking lot. I'm going to go there, no, I'm gonna go, and I'm going to walk all the way up to Fourth Cliff. The answer is no. Now, does that mean that, you know, some of maybe other of your neighbors, well, your neighbors have the same issue. They're not going to go and sit in front of your home unless the tie's up on their property. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think from a practical standpoint, are people literally from Sand Hills or anybody, um, Egypt or Mina, going to say, I'm going to go to the fourth cliff in front of your home? No. But I'm, that's why I say to you, I'm like, uh, you're going to be the first one that we're doing with beach for nourishment. I think Mina's the other one that we've been looking at to do. And you're actually the first one. I think it's a fascinating project because the benefit of it all, and I think you guys know the benefit of it all, is that if there's a storm that takes it away, we can actually get 75% reimbursement through FEMA. To put it back could, up. Could you repeat that for me again? If there's a storm that washes it away, is it guaranteed 75% reimbursement from FEMA? FEMA. It's a federal disaster. It's a federal disaster. Right, it has to be declared like most of okay. that it was a federal disaster. But I'm saying if that's the case, then 
75% of that's going to be paid by FEMA. Which is we, on the other hand, have to pay it. The town has to pay the other one. The town, all of us. I don't live near it down there. And I'm going to have to pay that for my own taxes. Well, I pay that's that's with that on the mainland that you would too. Yeah. That works both ways. So if that becomes... That doesn't count. So that... Yes, it does to me. Because I don't have access to the property, and I don't get water to help it. I don't get water from Situ, and I'm paying for a water main replacement. No, you are. You're getting water from Marshall, but you're, we're paying for that. The town is. So you're getting water just because of the source. Like we said with the utility source, it's irrelevant. You're getting. We're paying for that. Situ's paying for, for your water. At a premium. At a premium, I might add, okay. because we're paying commercial rates, not residential rates. Can I ask another question, which you brought up? You've com compared the seawall to, to nourishment. Sure. And I submit to you there are two separate items. A seawall shall last 40, 50, 60 years. The nourishment is going to last, according to John Ramsey, four, seven, maybe ten years before it needs to be reprofiled, regraded. Mm -hmm. My concern there is you don't get the you don't make the federal limit and get the money, and then you don't do the work. But you have my easement, but you're not coming back on to fix the problem. There's no sunset clause, and that, that's a concern. I'm putting this on the, out to the board. I understand. Okay? I'm giving away for the rest of my life and in perpetuity my land. It's the same issue with seawalls, though. If the seawall doesn't get declared a, a, a federal emergency, you're stuck with that seawall. I'll say it again. Seawall should get. My seawall for my house is 60 years old. 60. You're comparing that to a five year burn. Not the same elephant. It's not. You say five years, it's not five years. That's what John Ramsey is. Tell me all this. Well, you have to write a second. So, uh, oh, folks, we're going to ask a question. We're going to give an answer. Okay. We're going to interrupt each other, okay? Go ahead. So, Ramsey actually gave us a, um, um, what was it, a, a presentation. My memory was it depends, but it's not just five years. The, the, it does begin to erode, but I, I remember it was anywhere between 10 to 20 years potentially for different That's things. But I, can, I can clarify that for you. Right. I, I don't need clarification about the thing. You raise an issue that we, we're con you're concerned about. That's a valid concern. Well, but it's a concern that you have to say, do you want beach renourishment in front of your house right now, knowing the current situation? And if the answer is no, then... No, the answer is yes, to be honest with you, sir. I do. I'm in favor of this project. And I'm just looking for something on the other side of, of a ledger here, that if you can't fix it eight years from now, and there's no, no appetite in the federal budget to, to do this stuff, and they just rather let it go out to sea. Well, we see he's, we think I have an easement back, and I'll have that on my record when I go try to sell my remaining property. You're always going to owe it. It's always going to be your property. The easement takes, makes less value. I know I've made the argument, the other side, that protection makes more value. I, I can make the argument in both directions. But uh, my point is, if you can't, maintain it, then you don't need an easement. Well, you know what? We can worry about what the future's going to hold, and if that's how we're going to project ourselves going forward, mm -hmm. then there's not much I can tell you about it. I mean, it's either you trust that the town's going to try to do the right thing here and, and protect the property because the water's rising, we're getting more storms, we're getting a lot more uh, damage along our coastline, and, you know, you know, again, it just comes back to if the, if the answer is no, I don't want to give an easement, then that's your right. There's nobody saying no to that. Yes, yeah, you're saying. No, the point is, I want to give an easement. My answer to that would be, what we're getting the easement for is what we are constructing. But that gets washed away. There's, there's nothing there. They can't go up to what, one foot from your property and put the beach It's also chair. for the dredging. It's not a one bar easement. That easement is for the dredging of the South River and Beach nourishment. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It only pertains to your property. The only thing I, I would like to add to that, it, 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 to your concern about, you know, 10 years from now and you're giving up the property, if, if we go forward and we get the easements, we get this, and we have, you know, uh, uh, a good chance of getting the uh, federal disaster and reimbursements down the road, if that, for that to change, in my view, is climate gets so bad, the water's up 20 feet, and FEMA walks away from it, in which case the nourishment's not going to do any good anyway. So your risk of what, your risk is more you're going to lose your property than somebody going to be able to access anything in front of the seawall. 
So I think when you have to, as John says, you have to make those choices, but the benefits um, on the very you know, the various paths that could happen in the future are um, are much less of an impact than not protecting your property with this kind of project. And I know you've thought all those things through, but you know if if we don't get community support to go forward and it's on the moon, and you guys are going to be sitting there at the next storm without at least a buffer for however long it lasts, that buffer. I've actually had people say that to me. Oh, okay. They'd rather let the seat take their land than oh. to give it to the town, to which I vehemently argued and said, I do argue mine. No, there's nothing we're going to do to I, I understand that. I'm just trying to tell the board some of the discussions I've had with my neighbors. And that's, that was one of them. Well, hopefully the next round of education will help some of those, but I know the town's worked really hard to hmm. put you the know, facts out. I'm sorry. Uh, around yeah. question. Yeah. I wanted to get back to uh, the question. Jim Lee, 274 Central Ave. Yeah. Um, I provided some comments to Nancy Durfee, specifically was in the area of um, where it talks about the permanent easement, and then it said, such, such act, such shall not be as exercise, and it provided some language in there that was acceptable to us. What changes were made there? I guess I'm not sure what you provided and what um, specifically, it says where there exists, and what would be acceptable, which wasn't that phrase, was calmer currently or in the future. Do you know what version that is? Because there's... Uh, yeah, this one. Nine, I four, think any of those things went to town council, and it went back a couple of times, back and forth a couple of times. So that might have been suggested draft language. <laughs> yeah. And there were different versions of the easement. I know Nancy had gone out with some suggested changes, and then they were voted on last year, so... The current easement is online, and this updated language is what's in place. So I guess I just really don't know. You know what? Well, I'd like to provide some answers in January. Yeah. I don't. I don't see. You find. I don't see it. But uh, okay. So it's on right now. It's been finding her files. Do you have that easement from Nancy in January, and has changed? Oh, twice since yeah. Why? Yeah. Sorry. So I, I couldn't answer your question, sir. Because it's been changed. The, what what the, the version, the final version draft? I don't see what you're referencing. Sorry. Okay, so how would I get that address? I guess you got to take a look at the current draft, and if you have uh, any suggestions or any uh, revisions, and you'd have to get that back. Can you, can you get that language from Brad so I can? Yeah. yeah. Just get the, it'll save you. If you get the Brad's faster than me going through the files looking for it. That's all. Yeah, I can email. Them. Yeah. Wow, I have it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Don't look at it. But are you coming tomorrow night? Yeah. Good. Be a copy there. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I mean, if you give me the I'm going to do the same answer I'm giving you tonight. I'm just kidding. I haven't seen it. So if you get it to me in advance, I can at least take a look at it and say, we considered it for whatever reason it's not in there, or maybe we can put it in. But if you just do it every tomorrow night, I can say, well, I don't know. I'm going to get back to you. So you get to us to look at the fastest. So if you have Brad's email or my email, I know you have Brad's or stuff, you'll just send it over. Okay. I'll get that tomorrow morning. I'll, I'll get that over. Okay. Yes. All right. So what I was trying to explain about the two easements, when Nancy originally was talking to people, she said the easement for the, if you sign the easement for the dredging, which would put the dredge material back onto the beach, it would also include the beach nourishment so it encompassed the two things there have been several requests to nancy that they be two separate easements because the at that time the engineering plans had not been completed for the beach nourishment and people were willing to sign the straight easement for the dredging because they were told the material was going to go back onto the beach then recently it, uh, we, uh, people found out that the dredge material was not going on the beach, that it really hadn't been researched, and that it was going offshore to the mass disposal site. That caused a lot of confusion and concern because people had thought that material was going to go there, and now all of a sudden they had changed, but they felt no one had, dis had disclosed it. And that kind of made a communication breakdown. I mean, 
I think it's important to share some of these things because the person that had done a lot of this and communicated isn't here anymore. Brad's picking up the pieces. You all are trying to figure out what materials are where. Um, but you have residents that were told these uh, things. Some people signed the easement based on the fact that the material would go on the beach and it didn't, and then they felt that they had been deceived. Yeah, because I can. So, um, what the Coastal Resource Officer Nancy had originally tried to do was to kill two birds with one stone, which was to construct an easement that addressed the South River dredging project, which is a separate project that had a potential of putting about 30,000 cubic feet of sand on the eastern side of Hummer Rock and also giving access in that same area for this beach renourishment project. That was her goal. Now, the, the projects aren't aligned because obviously this beach renourishment is much longer as, as, you know, put back. The dredge project had, and Brad, you can back me up on here, had 12 samples taken of the different sand sure. material. Yep. Over five of those samples have been deemed incompatible and unsuitable to go back and be protective on the eastern side of, of, of the shore. Nancy communicated that at June 25th, that the dredge material that she has been, that she was notified, and you can watch the YouTube video, because it was recorded, she did let folks know that that dredge material was incompatible and that it was more than likely that that dredge material was not going to be coming to us that is going to be going offshore. So that's where that sat. Um, I don't think it was anybody's intention to mislead anyone. There was no way of knowing that part of that material was going to be deemed incompatible. The hope was that it was going to be compatible and that we were going to get a double shot here. We are going to get 30,000 cubic feet of sand while we work to get a two-year bigger project of beach renourishment done. So um, I understand that there was confusion, but she did communicate that on June 25th. Um, and I, that sand is, is gone. I mean, I know, Brad, you want to speak to the last samples that? Yeah, so we have a meeting, and I wasn't on the project at the beginning, but from what I can take, and I've had conversations with both of the consultants, or our consultants that worked on that, and state agency folks, so again, if there were a dozen or 13 samples, at least two of them um, had clay and other materials um, that we need to do further chemical analysis on. So basically, because of what could potentially contaminants or whatever they consider the clay, it's compatible with beach nourishment. So basically, you do the chemical testing to figure out where you can help it, whether it's Mass Bay or Cape Cod, as opposed to offshore sites. Then there were another four or five uh, samples that had too high level of fines, which means that it was not um, it's not compatible with what the sand is that's on home rock now. So if you dump something that has too high level of fine sand material, it's just going to wash away. So then you have a much smaller pool of potential sand or sediment that you can use for nourishment. And then now, since you have so many different samples that are either compatible or not compatible, when you're doing mechanical dredging, which you have to do in South of the dredge, you have like three or four stockpiles of material to then get that smaller amount of material that might be compatible to bring it to the beach, you're probably paying four times, three or four times the going rate on a beach nourishment project. And at that time, when you're only putting 50,000, I'm just, I don't know the exact number, but even if you just say half of that 30,000 onto a beach at three or four times the cost for a beach that needs several hundred thousand cubic yards of material, I think the cost on a benefit ratio there is very much. So I mean, you, you should pay kind of two or three or four times more than something's worth to get that small amount of benefit. So, it is unfortunate, and again, I think before that was known, I believe Nancy, you know, earnestly was just trying to make, to get the instruments and, and kill two birds at once, time, like Laura says. I don't think it was deceiving on any part, but that set of sample <coughs> analysis came in after, I think she was trying to just get folks to sign the easement, just in case, just in case we could either get that or, you know, have this easement be utilized for the North Carolina project. And that makes a lot of sense. However, there is one glitch to that, and she did state that the reason that the dredging couldn't go back onto the beach 
was because people didn't sign the easement and there was not enough room at the bottom of the fourth cliff for all the material. She had forecasted approximately 30,000 cubic yards of material from the dredge. However, the dredge then got broken up into three different phases instead of the one. Therefore, now the 30,000 cubic yards was reduced down to 10,000 cubic yards and there would be more than enough room at the bottom of the fourth lift for that. Like when the road was built in 2015, it wrapped around the fourth lift. The reason I'm stating this is because with that statement, based on the, uh, I mean, I attended the meeting that Moore is referencing, and yes, I heard that, and I understand completely what Brad's saying, because that makes a lot of sense. But again, with that additional, uh, conflicting information, it makes people wonder which which story it is it. I, I was just going to say, any of the meetings that Nancy has spoken, when I've been there, and even when you have close to Fort Cliff, we don't call any of the shots. It was always up to the Army Corps to say where that disposal site was going to be. I never, I'm not saying she didn't say it or she did say it, but anytime. We and she was spoken to me. It was always up to the Army Corps where that was going to go. And I can remember 20 years ago, there was a company that did a uh, hydraulic dredging project that didn't go very well in the South River. And they tried to do just what Brad said, pump it onto the beach, and it didn't go very well. So I think we're all hopeful it could go on the beach if it was compatible, but that's out of our hands. I, I, I never heard of the Air Force. And they're also, the Air Force has some money somewhere to do some offering of that total life of that term. So you know, so, but, but right now, the time is just not lining up. Actually, as this is case put it up, we're doing what's called Area A, which is the actual mouth of the South River, which is, Fourth Cliff is now on the South River, the part of Fourth Cliff in Washington. It's a hazard of navigation, it has to get done. Uh, that's going to get done in the next, hopefully, we get the grant the next dredging period we're allowed, which I think is in the fall. So we don't have any place to put that, we don't have agreements to put it there, so that material's gonna have to go someplace else. But then we have the entire length of the South River from area A, which again is the mouth, all down to the first bridge, and then Marshfield wants to do between the bridges, you know, different conversation, but right now the dredging that we're going to do, we don't have any agreements that we can put it anywhere, we don't have permits to put it anywhere, and it's just gonna have to be because Brad said it's not compatible anyway, so uh, it's kind of too front. That's just stuff. You get that trench, you're just going to have to go to get that room. Well, wow. this uh, is an agenda item to vote on to approve the draft Easter letter uh, sent to the Hummer Rock residents. Any other questions? Oh, I'd say, say accept the motion. Yes, just one last question. One last question because I got to move this three hour meeting and we're going to take a break at 10 because I really don't want, you know, sitting here for three hours, we need to take a break. So, one last question. I can, I can respect that. Um, why did the attorney not want the verbiage in the letter to go onto the um, easement? It belong. It doesn't to make belong. it separate. You don't put the like language in somebody like, you know, this is not to be recorded. Uh, this is only to be re recorded if the, the project goes forward. That you don't put that equal language, easement language. It doesn't go on. It, it just doesn't. Okay. That's all. Thank you. All right, motion. Do we want to do anything with, with the language that this gentleman has that Jim's going to look at tomorrow? Well, I think he I think you want to approve the cover letter of the easement, and if we have to come back and amend it, we can come back and amend it. You um, said the current version. I don't, not, sorry. I don't think it's going to change. I don't, yes, I don't think it's going to change. I mean, the council has been very clear that the easement needs to be as clean as possible. I'll make a motion to approve the draft easement and letter form for the Hummer Rock residents for the future nourishment project. Motion by Ms. Kerman. Second by Mr. Vignani. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
uh, discussion vote of the senior center architect contract. Uh, just very briefly, the board has already approved the architect for the senior center five and a half inch site. So just to execute the contract with them. It's the end of the AA contract. That we have the Questions for the board? I just, I was curious, just because I don't understand, why um, furniture, fixture, and equipment would be, if they're just doing design and development, why the architect would have... Still, you still show the cost and the design, what the furniture is going to be. So when we got cost, it has to include furniture and all that stuff. Um, no, because this contract is for design and engineering, it's not the pricing of the construction. So it's not going to cost 20 grand. Design, it's going to show pictures and furnishings and all that stuff that the dentist can get prepared. It's not going to be just an empty building. Um, okay. An empty building. It's going to show the furnishings and fixtures and all that stuff that's on the budget. And the other is the unknown item is not, if, if they go in and they think that there's going to be a huge abatement, that's outside of the scope of this. And not when they have to have a separate entity. Okay, I just wanted everybody to know that that was a wild card out there. That's always it. Yeah. So, like a baby grand piano? Sorry, Lauren, <laughs> do you have a question? <laughs> There's a piano there, actually, recreation ground. <laughs> I just, have a, I just have a question in the additional services. Because um, up in the cover letter, um, he writes Jim that um, you know he's going to explore the different options. Um, so, but then in the responsibility of the additional services, it says multiple preliminary designs not provided. So I was kind of confused by that. It sort of seemed to contradict. Yeah, I mean, providing options and providing preliminary designs are two different things. I mean, you can do drawing showing this one a little bit, but those aren't preliminary designs. Okay, so. Preliminary well, designs much. But we'll at least get a couple, couple that's my concern. Yeah. So we just get a couple yeah, unless, of renderings of different options, not just, hey, we looked at this. I think the board wants to see. Right. I mean, the, the only way we looked at this would be the question about saving pot or right. the Right. You know, that'd be hey, we looked at this and too, yeah. you know, like way that. too expensive. But yeah. um, there'll be numerous public meetings and talking about what the designs are look like. Okay. And all that. That's my question. Any other? No. Motion. Motion to approve Barbara Henry and Archetype a contract for architectural services for the senior center. Motion by Ms. Canfield, seconded by Second. Ms. Curran. Uh, All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Unanimous. Uh, now we're going to move over into new business. Uh, discussion and vote. Uh, open the fall special town meeting warrant. That's a quick motion. Move that the board of selectmen open the warrant for the fall special town meeting to be held on November 14, 2018. Second. Motion by Ms. Curran, second by uh, Mr. Mignani. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Takes care of that. Then we've got a discussion vote of one day um, liquor license, it looks like, or is it a day malt and wine license, actually? Silent Chef for an event for the Situate Maritime Center on August 25th, 2018, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Do we have to take these individually? No. Um, Taylor made bartending for an event at the Situate Harbor Community Building on August 26, 2018, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Silent Chef for an event at the Situate Maritime Center on September 8, 2018, from 12.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Silent Chef for an event at the Situate Maritime Center on September 28, 2018, from 5.30 to 9.30 p.m. Motion by Ms. Cantor, seconded by Mr. Mignani. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Next, moving over to uh, liaison reports. Seeing none, um, <coughs> correspondence. 
Can I, can I say something to liaison? I know you want to get out of here. Just one minute, just quick. One minute, you got three it. minutes go. just for that. Yeah, exactly. Now you got 55 seconds, let's go. I would like to share. <laughs> no, I would like to share that the Affordable, Trust, Affordable Housing Trust has sold um, its last uh, unit that it owned in town to a deserving family. Ah. Robin Nelson Road, we oh, signed the PNS last week. Wow. Um, so that's excellent news. Um, the only thing that is left remaining is, you know, a piece of land that hopefully a developer, we can negotiate with the developer to uh, build another affordable house. But that's great news, so I want to thank the trust, uh, Barbara Cox and Steve Irish and that's great. Um, everybody. They did a great job. That is really good. That's So, sorry. Yeah, that's excellent. But good news. I'm waiting on your other report. That's the liaison that's report. report. Any other liaison reports? Oh, so nice. <laughs> um, no, I just want to let people know uh, Council on Aging is having an arts and crafts fest, uh, fair at 44 Jericho Road this Saturday from 10 to 4. Um, it's a fundraiser to benefit the Council on Aging and also Friends of Situate Senior um, Building Project. That's a very cool um, correspondence. Um, I, this is this important. Is important. I know this is really important. I'm going to skip the correspondence to the next meeting, but this one's important. Cosmos Cafe yes. will be reopening on September 6th. That's very important for the town to know. They're on vacation. Um, there are a number of other letters that I will go through quickly. Um, the United States um, Environmental Protection Agency has written a letter to um, inform us that we have been compliant with total, total copper affluent limits since uh, November 30th, 2017. Um, that was a program that's been ongoing for a while to eliminate those. We have a letter from uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission um, informing us that uh, Front Street Liquor doing business at Citroen Package Store uh, would have their license suspended for a period of four days, two of which will be served in October 3rd and 4th, and two will be held in abeyance for two years if they behave themselves. Um, and that? MAPC has sent a letter um, informing us that nomination papers are due for the Boston Regional Planning Organization. All the details are on the file at the uh, selectman's office. Uh, oh, and this one's an important one too. We received a, a very nice letter from a resident that commended uh, Lorraine Devon in the selectman's office for her exemplary work at straightening out a problem for a rental of uh, um, the Maritime Center for an event. And uh, that was signed by Mary Lou Butler, and thank you for recognizing Lorraine's hard work. Um, we also received a letter from the Toll Brothers thanking all of the departments and committees in situ for their professional and accessible um, work throughout their very long process um, towards their approval. That's all for our first project. Right. Um, next we have, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's the move the board of in meeting minutes. Move to accept the minutes of the Board of Selectmen meeting held on July 24th and August 13th, 2018. All right. Motion by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Vignani. All in favor? Aye. 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 Take care of that. And uh, I think is that it? That's it. That's it. Uh, no, I think we also have to approve the minutes for the um, water meeting. Or is that what that is? That is the August 13th. No, that was, was the 13th. 13th. Yeah. yeah. Um, other than that, any other business anybody wants to share? No, Mr. Chair. No? All right, I do have two things. Quick up. Um, don't forget, September 1st, the Parade of the Horribles down in Hummer Rock. <laughs> it's uh, a Saturday from 1 to 3, and, you know, this is a great um, time of year, wrapping up the official vacation of summer. And for anybody, if you haven't, it's, it's a fun local tradition down in Hummer Rock where people put floats in. Uh, it's, it's a parade they do, and it's called the Horribles because I think they generally, <laughs> you never know what you get when you go there. Um, and it's a great community event, so I highly recommend, if you haven't gone, 
enjoy it, go down and see it on Saturday. If you miss Saturday's parade, and I'm not sure which camera we're looking at here, but if you miss Saturday's parade, this one, this one, that one, um, then on Sunday uh, at Sand Hills, there is the Sidgwick Beach Association's parade uh, from 12. I think it kicks off at 1. Let's go down to 12 to 3. And again, it's, it's actually the oldest parade in Sidgwick. Um, 18, I said 19, I think 18, when they first started doing it. And um, again, another community-based parade where you can go. Uh, people put floats together, they decorate it, uh, they march, there's a parade, uh, some bands. Uh, just a great way of wrapping up summer and uh, at clowns. So, um, highly recommend it if you, if you uh, Jim, bring your kids um, from South Sydney, we bring them on over. And um, it, it's a good take. I saw the movie hit on HBO, I'm not going to get it. Um, aside from that, just don't forget we are having our meeting on September 4th. We will be addressing some water um, actions in the plan, uh, plan of actions that we're discussing. Other than that, I entertain a motion to adjourn to sign documents. So moved. Motion by Mr. Mignani. Second by Ms. Curran. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.